So uh, today I try to use the iPad. Okay. So uh, this is the second lecture. And since my lecture yesterday, part of it, you cannot see. So let me repeat a little bit about uh, what I covered last time. So today's our first uh, define what's this uh, sequence of adapted metric. And then I will uh, introduce this uh, second ingredient in the talk, uh, this uh, main result, and that's an inequality of Duta, Jeffa, Harry, and also modified by Li, Qing, and Xi. Okay, so that's the second topic. And then I will report some uh, perturbation compactness result, and then I will cover some uniqueness result. So let me start with uh, adapted metric. So I covered this uh, last yesterday, but let me repeat. So on this uh, manifold with boundary, so my manifold is of dimension D, but my D is the same as uh, uh, math uh, notation D equal to N plus one. So that means the boundary is of dimension N and the interior is of dimension n plus one. And then my assumption of conformal compact Einstein means that I have this Einstein metric G plus, which is actually a Poincare Einstein metric. That means Ricci of G plus equal to minus n G plus. And then I have for uh, this uh, some existence of some defining function on the manifold, and then rho squared times g plus now is a compact manifold on a, man, a metric on x closure and whose restriction to the boundary is g hat. Okay, so g hat is a code conformal infinity of this manifold. Okay. So uh, this is a mistyping. So now uh, I used to denote G hat by H. So now this is a, a G hat is a boundary metric. G hat is a boundary metric. I assume it's a CK alpha metric, some smoothness. And then I construct a function V which has the property that uh, we will see that uh, this V is constructed from the boundary metric and which solve this equation, okay, Poisson equation. And I denote it by parameter S. And one result we will use is the following. That is, if the boundary metric G hat has scalar curvature positive, then as a result of a consequence of Jack Lee's uh, theorem, this equation, Poisson equation is solvable for all S. Okay, so there is a no point spectrum. So this S times N minus S is solvable, except there is a pole. This is a meromorphic family except when S at the point N. So you solve it with Poisson data. So what does Poisson data means? Poisson data means this equation PDE has two indices, index, index. One is N minus S, one is S. Okay. So given G hat, yesterday we also mentioned there is a geodesic defining function. So this R is constructed with respect to the G hat. So you, this Vs is solving so that the leading power is N minus S and with the Dirichlet data F is equal to one and then there is an expansion. But then there is a correction term. The correction term is R to the S power and then there is another function. That function is the scattering data of the original function. 
it turns out that if we write the parameter s as n over two plus gamma, then this correction term, the leading term, power of r to the s is a fractional curvature. And that's called Q to gamma curvature. So this is a curvature which comes from uh, this uh, uh, P two Q two gamma is equal to some fractional power. This is uh, uh, what we call this uh, GJMS operator of order two gamma. So it's a, this is a starting from minus Laplacian on the boundary to the gamma power and plus some correction term. Okay, so P2 gamma at one is equal to Q2 gamma, but this gamma can be a, not an integer. So this is a, a scattering data. Okay. So one can solve this V of S and then if scalar curvature of G hat is positive, then uh, one can solve this for all S and this Vs is strictly positive. One can show this Vs is strictly positive if it's uh, coming from the Poisson data one. So one can take this Vs to the one over n minus s power. So that makes this function V as start leading order term is R. So this is the geodesic defining function. And what called this adapted metric is this parameter family of Gs, which is rho s squared G plus. Okay. So we have a for each parameter S, we have adapted metric. And in the particular case, when we take gamma equal to N over two plus one. Okay, so now I'm concentrating on my shelf, my shelf on the particular index when D is equal to four and then the boundary is dimension three. So at the, in this case, at this uh, gamma equal to this particular index, we recover Jack Lee metric. So Jack Lee metric is one of those uh, geodesic, this uh, uh, adapted metric, that's the Lee metric. In this case, this V starts with one over R. So the Jack Lee metric is actually V to the minus two G plus at this particular index. And uh, say in when N equal to three, then my index S is equal to uh, N over two plus one plus uh, five over two is equal to four when N equal to three. So in this particular, this is the G4 parameter. And yesterday I also mentioned, so we discussed Jack Lee metric, which has scalar curvature strictly positive if the boundary metric has curvature, scalar curvature positive. And later on, I also will use another parameter and that's the parameter gamma equal to one half. Okay. So when, when gamma equal to one half, then this is a parameter, the equation V is particularly is equal to rho. So uh, I, will, I will talk more about this index later. And this V uh, starts with R and minus a constant, actually one third times the mean curvature of R square and so on as in totic behavior, totically. And these are V, so V is, you can choose it to be equal to rho. And this metric, this G2 metric is scalar flat. Okay. 
And uh, I will talk more about this particular metric before. So this is an, another example. So we have one family, which is one health, gamma equal to one health, the other is five over two. But it turns out in this special dimension, when n equal to three, there is another adapted metric, which is particularly interesting. And this happened when gamma equal to three over two. Okay. No, 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 yeah, yeah. Vs is solvable on the whole net manifold. Uh, rho S is a def globally defined, globally defined. R is asymptotically defined. R is a particular geodesic defining function is uh, in a neighborhood. So this behavior is near the boundary. This V is asymptotically, you only control it in a neighborhood. But VS is globally defined. Yeah. That's right, 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 right. So, so we define that. And then there is this index, gamma equal to three over two. And the way we parameter it, S is equal to N over two plus gamma. So at this particular index, S equal to N. So this happened to be when this parameter Poisson equation is meromorphic, has a pole. Okay. So instead of that PDE, this uh, Poisson equation, one need to take its derivative. So if one take this solution V of S, and then if S is not equal to N, V S is solvable, and you take the derivative of that and call that W. So you get a function W. And in this case, the Poisson equation, if one plug in this W and dot it with ds, one get this equation, minus Laplace W equal to three, equal to N, okay. And in this particular index, so in this case, the Adapted metric is exponential to WG. Okay. So this becomes this exponential function. And this W become to have asymptotic behavior log one over R and plus a function A plus a function B R to the nth power. So this is nth power. Nth power n equal to three. And A on the boundary is equal to zero, okay. So this metric was studied, this particular PDE was studied earlier by Pfefferman Grant. So in this particular index, I call this adapted metric Pfefferman Grant metric. And the particular feature of it is now, because we take exponential, the non-local information comes from this B restrict to the boundary. And that's the Q3 metric, QN metric. Okay. So this is the non-local information. And this non-local information has the particularly good property. The integration of that is a conformal invariant. Okay. So this uh, is an integration of QN is invariant. Conformal in there. Okay. So, and so we think this is a, a, a metric, a particular good metric to study. So let me list it in this particular index, n equal to three, d equal to four, uh, the property of this metric, d equal to four. Okay. First, this metric has Q4 of it, Q4 curvature of that equal to zero. So what's Q4 curvature? Q4 curvature can be written down as Laplace scalar plus scalar square minus three Ricci square. Okay. 
So this metric, P4 metric in four dimension has the good property is related to a fourth order PDE. And that's called a P4 operator, which start with the plus square and plus some second order term. The second order term has coefficient in terms of the scalar of the metric and the ratio of the metric. And then there's this derivative and then divergence. So it's a second order, low order term. And the philosophy now is in four dimension, P4 is behave like Laplace in two dimension. Okay. So in four dimension, it turns out P4 under conformal change of metric is, so my GW means uh, uh, E2WG, E2WG. Okay. So e under conformal change is E to the minus 4WP4. So this is a P4 of G. So remember uh, the Laplace operator in two dimension when D equal to two, Laplace of GW is E to the minus two W Laplace of G. So in four dimension, this is a replacement of the Laplace operator. So let's, uh, this uh, in general, this P4 expression has this curvature in turn there. So in particular, when G is Einstein, then the expression of P4 is particularly easy. It's the conformal Laplacian. So the conformal Laplacian is Laplacian plus a multiple of scalar. So I don't know why the writing here is messy. So it's minus Laplace plus a constant times scalar. So this constant is this particular constant, D, D minus two or four D minus one. So P4 is the conformal Laplacian composite with minus Laplace. So in this case, if we look at our Poincaré Einstein metric, P4 has a good expression, is Laplacian composite with minus Laplacian minus two. And Q4 for the G plus metric, if one plug in this constant, it's equal to six. Okay. So for Einstein metric, P4 is easy. And then this uh, uh, Q4, six is equal to, uh, Q4 is equal to this. Okay. And then there's this uh, PDE. Another good property of P4 is P4 of, G plus operating on W plus Q of G plus is equal to Q of GW. Uh, this is for any G in particular for GW, Q4 of GW times E4W. Yes, yeah, that's a penis operator. It's a, uh, yeah independently discovered by pennies actually earlier than PJMS, GJMS operator. Okay. So uh, uh, this Q is actually called Bronson's Q curvature. Okay. okay, so the point I want to make is because Laplace, our particular Poisson equation minus Laplace equal to three. So P4 of W is equal to zero, so hence Q4 is zero, okay. So for the Pfefferman grand metric, the Q curvature is zero. So we call it Q flat, Q flat, okay. And then the other good property is this Pfefferman grand metric, G star is totally geodesic, okay. In actually this, For no, no, uh, yeah, we on the boundary of X. This is a com, com metric on the X closure. So, yeah, the boundary is totally geodesic. Okay, 
the yeah, I, I mean the total boundary is uh, totally geodesic. Actually, it's totally geodesic for this uh, parameter of this adapted metric for all n over two plus gamma when gamma is greater than one half. Gamma equal to one half just means to be totally geodesic. It's only umbilic, okay, umbilic. So uh, at, uh, in our early time, we prefer to use a metric which is totally geodesic. So that means when we deal with this, uh, uh, later on deal with this Bach equation, we pretend the boundary is not there. Okay, so it's totally geodesic. A manifold with totally geodesic boundary for, from the PDE point of view is like behave like a manifold without boundary. That's what I'm saying. Uh, no, then you have regularity on the boundary, problem on the boundary. Yes, but the, basically it's in that direction. Okay. Yes, yeah. Okay, so it's totally geodesic. But there is another hidden good property of this uh, metric, and that is uh, if the scalar curvature on the boundary, yes. Uh, the, to the scalar curvature of this uh, G hat, R hat means a scalar curvature of G hat on the boundary. So this is a... Uh... Say that again. Yes, G... Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we deal with regularity later. If depending on how much regularity you assume on the boundary, you have how much regularity for this parameter family G star in the interior. Yes, oh yeah. This S is a continuous parameter up to S equal to N and then it's a family. So at s equal to n, you need to deal with it, but it's a continuous family. Okay, continuous parameter. Up to, yeah. In, in a case when the scalar curvature is positive on the boundary, Jack Lee's theorem tells us it's parameter of a continuous family for all s. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. At one half, you need to deal with it. Yeah, there is a mean curvature pop up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That problem will occur tomorrow, but today I, I deal with platform gram metric. Okay, so and the other hidden good property of it is if the boundary scalar curvature is positive, we know Jack Lee's metric has the interior scalar curvature positive, but it turns out platform gram metric uh, actually for all G S metric when S is n over two plus gamma for gamma bigger than one or have scalar curvature positive. Okay, so this is a, a scalar curvature positive. This property uh, was proved uh, earlier uh, by Jeffrey Case and I, and uh, he uses some particularly good structure of this particular parameter of GS. And a hidden property is this is satisfy another PDE, which is a fourth order PDE. Okay. So that means this if S is equal to N over two plus gamma, then its scalar curvature and its traceless recess satisfy a second order, fourth order thing, fourth order means the curvature differentiate four times. So it's a second order in scalar, okay? So it's a divergence 
of the gradient of R, R is the scalar curvature, so it's a force of the PDE. And so if one compute that, it turns out is constant C1S and C2S on this parameter, S between N plus one to N over two plus one have a definite sign. Okay. So for example, if we are getting at S equal to N plus one, that becomes Jackley metric. In that case, C2S is zero. Okay, so that's the Jack Lee computation earlier. But we are now in a situation when this is a bigger than one and less than, uh, so in my in particular case, this is uh, uh, in this parameter, we start with the metric and we continue. And this family is a continuous family so one use continuity method to say if you start with the index whose scalar curvature is positive, if you stop somewhere, if the scalar curvature is greater than or equal to zero, then this PDE tells you the scalar continue to be positive because at the minimum point, you now have a sign of the scalar curvature. Okay, so. So this property comes from this metric, but we know this parameter has positive scalar curvature. And later on in the uh, lecture, I also say that this Pfeffman grand metric, we choose it for many other reasons. One of the technical reason is we can deal with epsilon regularity property of this sequence of, of this metric. So by epsilon regularity, the purpose of that is suppose this metric is say C2, assume G star is T C2, then because it's conformal Einstein, we can use the Bach equation to gain. Okay, so C2 implies C2 alpha, the epsilon regularity. But uh, uh, I, I will now talk about why there is an epsilon regularity property of this sequence of, of this Jack Lee metric. Okay, so uh, that's uh, this uh, uh, adapted metric. So in the statement of the theorem, we will use this particular adapted metric called Pfeffman grant adapted metric. Now let me introduce another, I think, key ingredient in this subject, and that's uh, an inequality attained by a Dutta Jawahari, and also by uh, Li Qing and Xi. Okay, so uh, the this is actually an inequality in the paper of Dutta Jawahari, but in the proof uh, there is uh, some gap not some gap, some detail, which is not filled in. That is, uh, they never deal with a uh, locus point of geodesics. And the later paper, besides, uh, there's other result in this later paper, LQS in paper, but they fill in, deal with the locus point. So there is a technical improvement. Okay, so what's their inequality? Their inequality says, they only assume this is asymptotic hyperbolic. Yesterday, I also mentioned CCE metric manifold or always is asymptotic hyperbolic. So a hyperbolic, and if the boundary Yamabe is positive, I assume it's C3 metric, and then I fix a point in the manifold. And they only assume Rizzi is greater than or equal to minus NG plus, and then scalar curvature is O e to the minus two t, where t is the hyperbolic distance to the manifold. So we have the case of x here, I'm sorry, x here, and fixed arbitrary point p, and then there is this ball t. And this t is the distance of a point in G metric of to this particular point. Okay, 
So this is the distance pole. And then uh, we know that uh, this metric, this, uh, there is, uh, if you consider this ball, volume of the ball in this metric, Einstein metric, compared to the volume of the ball to the hyperbolic metric, we know it's always less than equal to one. So this is always less than equal to one. And we also know it's a monotonic function in T and it's greater than equal to the volume of the boundary of the ball comparison. That's bishop Gromov comparison theorem. The inequality says, assume boundary has a scalar curvature positive, Yamabe positive, the this volume of the ball has a lower bound. And that lower bound is in terms of the quotient of the Yamabe metric on G hat to the Yamabe metric on the canonical metric of S3. I'm sorry, I think I, I, I didn't. I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think I, I, I mix up something. Do we assume this sphere? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, okay. So there's a, uh, uh, I need to double check, but uh, we are going to apply this to S3. Then the code, the, the, this is S3 of GC. Okay, so this is uh, SD minus one of GC, and this is uh, Y of uh, SD minus one of G hat. Okay, so uh, let me only code a theorem on, on ball, and then the boundary is the sphere. And so the Yamabe quotient, constant of Yamabe to the canonical metric, the quotient of that is a lower bound. Okay, there is a lower bound. So in particular, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the this is always the sphere. And that could be arbitrary boundary. Okay. So anyway, this quotient of volume has a bound, has a lower bound. If your boundary of the Yamabe metric has a lower bound. Okay. So uh, uh, in tomorrow, I will present some sketch of idea of this inequality. Okay. So if one apply this to the ball, you immediate consequence of this inequality is if the boundaries of is the sphere, then you have the left hand side is greater than equal equal to one, the right hand side is less than equal to one. So the volume becomes the same as hyperbolic ball. So that's the conformal filling in of the unique one is B4 S3GH. Okay, a consequence of this inequality. That also uh, sort of answer a little bit about your question. You start with X, your boundary is S sphere, then your feeling in, unique feeling in is the ball because it's already hyperbolic. Okay, okay. sure. Okay, and so uh, now let me report this uh, perturbation theorem. Perturbation, one perturbation theorem uh, we have is uh, uh, if we assume, so for simplicity, we, we assume it's S3. Okay. Maybe one can deal with other boundary X, but suppose S3. And then if you have a sequence of boundary metric G hat, which is a conformal infinity of a sequence of metric there, which is CK alpha. You only need, uh, there's a little bit detail. B 
because uh, the reason we worry about the detail is the original existence and theorem is for C2 alpha, and we only can deal with it with CK alpha for K bigger than two. Okay. So uh, say, for example, C3. Okay. And then under the, then there exists a delta. If this uh, Yamabe constant is close enough to the boundary data, or if the vial L2 known, remember the vial L2 known in this dimension is a conformal invariant. So that means with respect to GJ plus metric and with respect to your GJ, the star metric is the same. Okay, so this condition is only putting on GJ plus. So the vial L2 known is small. Either this is big, this delta should be delta point. Okay, this constant may be different. Delta known. Okay. And if one of these conditions is satisfied, then the Pfefferman grand compactification is compact. Okay. And uh, it's also a CK alpha sense that is uh, in a Gromov, a Chigger Gromov sense. Uh, this is after diffeomorphism is CK alpha. So that's the perturbation theorem we have. Okay. So let me remark that uh, in the early stage, when we try to reach compactness, of the interior filling in from the boundary filling in, uh, we make a, a lot of effort trying to add conditions which are conformally invariant conditions because the boundary is a conformal class. In the early stage, we obtain results which are not sharp. For example, we have some theorem like uh, if the G3 metric, remember this G3, metric is uh, A alpha beta and normal derivative on the boundary. And this, uh, if this, uh, we call it the S tensor, if this uh, metric is in LP for some P bigger than one, then you reach compactness. So boundary condition plus some constraint on the asymptotic behavior, then you reach compactness. But in this case, in three dimension, this G3 is uh, the L1 known is a conformal invariant, not LP known. So we reach a compactness result, but it's sort of not the right one. So we are making effort to sharpen our results so that we only use compactness condition, a conformally invariant condition. And this is the first time we reach it but that's a perturbation result, okay. Okay, so, and then uh, we say a little bit more, okay. So suppose on a standard sphere on B4S3, let's look at the Pfefferman grand compactification. It turns out in that case, an uh, explicit computation shows it's not a flat metric on B4S3. So if you want a Q4 flat metric, of course the flat metric has Q4 equal to zero, but there's another one, and that's this Pfefferman grand one. And this is exponential one minus X squared times G flat, which has the, uh, compared to the standard flat metric, it's totally geodesic boundary. Okay, so if you have the original one, then it's not. Okay, so if we look at in the model case, we denote this by Pfefferman grand. And then for this theorem, we also know that our metric GI star with Yamabe constant tends to that of the Yamabe constant of the sphere on the boundary can up to this diffeomorphism be bring to a CK alpha neighborhood of the standard metric. So uh, the compactness is rich and you have this CK alpha closeness. Okay. So the, this uh, later on will lead to uniqueness of uh, the metric on the boundary. So let me put, uh, so I'm going to uh, prove this theorem. And let me uh, first say that uh, 
Uh, I have put two conditions, either A2 prime, that's the Yamabe constant close to that of the sphere, or this is not N, this is all the vial L2 condition. And it's not clear this A2 prime imply A2 double prime or the other way. At the beginning, we do not know. But the consequence of this compactness theorem, and we would reach these two conditions are equivalent conditions, equivalent condition. But that's a byproduct. We do not see it directly. So that's the first remark. And the second remark is, you notice we choose this particular metric and the uh, Pfefferman grand metric. And last year there is a paper by Fan Wang and she pointed out once your compactness is reached for one S and if this S is N over two plus gamma for some gamma bigger than one or if your compactness is reached for n over two plus one half, then all other GS are compact family. And for S prime equal to n over two plus gamma for all gamma bigger than zero. So that means if we reach compactness for Pfefferman gram metric, say in that case, our gamma equal to three over two, then you have compactness for all other family. So it just depends what parameter you are going, what adapted metric you are going to choose, more convenient to use to reach compactness. And once you reach there, it's all equivalent. Okay, it's all equivalent. Okay, and as we will see tomorrow, we will choose this particular index for other reason I will explain. Okay, I will explain. Okay. Okay, and the other remark is that uh, uh, this uh, perturbation result turns out to be true for all d bigger than or equal to four with a uh, vial L2 known uh, replaced by vial d over two known. Okay. And the proof of this, uh, this is uh, uh, in a paper last year by myself and uh, Yu Xinge, Qin Jie, and Jin, who is a graduate student of Qin. And so this proof of uh, to generalize to a high dimension actually has two parts. For D even and D odd, somehow the master is different. Okay. The asymptotic expansion is different. And then one use a, a different tool. In particular, when D is equal to e even, we still have this obstruction tensor, this buck tensor, which helps us to gain the epsilon regularity. Ypsilon, but for the other, we have used other methods. Okay. <clears throat> but I will not cover that. So in the rest of the talk, I will begin to uh, cover a uh, proof of perturbation theorem. So let me take a... Uh, uh, Three minutes break. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, family of metric on the boundary, which is compact. Say that. Uh, I, I, I assume it's Yamabe constant is bounded away from zero. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I think for asymptotic hyperbolic thing, 
I'm pretty sure you can do it on a, a near conformal infinity, but uh, I do not know if you can get it inside. Uh, okay. Uh, so you are asking for the scattering theory is a holding for asymptotic hyperbolic manifold. In some setting it does, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not completely sure. I need to check the detail, yeah. Okay, sure, yes, yes, yeah. So uh, okay. now I begin a, a sketch proof of this compactness result. So I assume the boundary is compact. And then I think that uh, the Yamabe constant on the boundary is very close to that of the standard sphere. Then I say this uh, family of Pfefferman Grand metric is already compact. So let me sketch a proof. Okay. So uh, that's the theorem. Uh, the main step, it turns out the main step is to show this family, compatified family has its curvature bump. Okay. So either in curvature is bounded or the gradient, it turns out for technical reason, we need this uh, a gradient of this is bounded, uniformly bounded. Assume the boundary metric is sufficiently smooth to start with. Okay. And then uh, the only way to show this is uh, to prove by contradiction. So uh, assume not. Then you call it supnon kj square, which go to infinity. And then you know there is some point which gets its, uh, this kj square. So you, you blow up around that point. And then we dilate the function by kj. So the purpose of the dilation now is this now you have this C1 known of the curvature, C1 means C1 known of the curvature at the point PJ is equal to one. And then you want to pass to limit. Okay. And now after this dilation, uh, this uh, bar has curvature bounded. So there's a Gromov-Hausdorff limit. I call it a G infinity bar which is uh, on X infinity, okay? So the, uh, this, is, uh, the, this is happening on X infinity. And now we look at this, this metric GJ is a conformal change of this Einstein metric and that conformal change, we call it rho j. So the bar is the same as rho j bar square g j plus. And this rho j is bar is the dilation of the original conformal factor g rho j. And then remember this uh, Pfefferman Grand metric has scalar curvature positive. And that translate to gradient of gj of rho j is less than or equal to one. This uh, uh, gj is this Pfefferman Grand metric has curvature bound. And this relation is dilation invariant. So for rho j bar and gj bar, <laughs> so uh, this is a, uh, uh, is also less than or equal to one. So that means this function rho j bar also converges on compact, on compacta. So this rho j bar has a limit. I call it rho infinity. And now you look backwards. So that means this has a limit, that has a limit. So this sequence of uh, this uh, uh, Einstein metric also has a limit. And that's a G infinity plus. 
Now G infinity. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Compact time. On X infinity, because X infinity is now not, not compact. And now, now this uh, GJ plus is, uh, has a limit, which is also answer. And uh, we know it's Risi. If it's smooth, it's Risi. It's also minus N G plus. Now, uh, now we want to say that uh, uh, we want to reach a contradiction. Okay. And what's the contradiction which is going for? Here I should first say something. Uh, there is a sense statement I should make first. And that is, remember our assumption. Our assumption is G, J, this is compact on boundary, say on S3. So the dilation of that, same dilation would uh, converge to a flat metric. Okay. So th this is a, 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 this is a boundary metric on S3. And it's a compact metric, compact sequence of metric. That's assumption, my assumption. So if I dilate it, then it becomes uh, on larger and larger interval. And I'm saying the conformal infinity of this is R3. And the compactness of this means this dilated boundary metric converges to standard metric on, S3, on R3, okay? Okay, so we have the situation X infinity and then the boundary conformal infinity I know is R3, okay? So it's, it's a, Yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. I'm saying it converges to a metric on R3, which is the flat metric in that sense. Okay, yes, okay, so. And now uh, we want to reach a compact. So our scheme now is, our goal now is to show this G infinity plus sitting on this uh, R3 and the universal being the universal cover being the upper half space is the hyperbolic metric, okay? And then after that, we are going to show this G infinity plus is the flat metric on the upper half space. And what's the contradiction? The contradiction will be this metric at a curvature at a point equal to one. And then we want to say this limit metric also has curvature at this, uh, uh, this uh, PJ point. Go, we need to discuss where does this blower point PJ goes. And then we want to show at that blow up limit is G infinity at that P infinity point curvature is also equal to one. So that means we need to show a little bit why uh, the convergence is more than C1, okay? So you have a function which is one, the limit metric, why the limit at that point is equal to one, you need uh, a bit more convergence, you need C1 alpha. And that's the epsilon regularity. So let's see where does that, so the first proposition is the epsilon regularity. And if we either look at this uh, Pfeffman grand metric or look at its uh, dilated metric, and we want to show it begin to gain. Once it has sen xi alpha xi k, it has xi k alpha. That's what we need, okay. And then here we use the property, this metric is conformal to Einstein. And conformal to Einstein, 
Matthew satisfied Bach flat condition. So what's Bach flat? Bach flat is uh, this is uh, a Bach metric is the critical point of the vial tensor. Vial L2 known and it satisfies Bach flat condition. So Bij is the second derivative of vial plus this uh, uh, rec uh, conjugated with vial. This is equal to zero. Okay. And this condition turns out to be a conformally invariant condition. That is uh, under conformal change. If one metric is buff flat, the other is also buff flat. So for Einstein metric, the buck tensor is equal to zero. Why? Because uh, this is because the derivative of this uh, uh, del vial is uh, this gradient vial, this uh, contracted with this L index is called curtain tensor. But this curtain tensor also can be expressed completely in terms of Ricci and scalar. Okay, so it's this. So using this relation, one can see that uh, for Einstein metric, Bach is flat. So for metric conformal to Einstein, it's Bach is flat. Bach is zero. And in the early work of Tien Vyakovsky and maybe even earlier than then, it's already pointed out that this Bach flat condition is an elliptic PDE when scalar curvature is a constant. So that means if one rewrite this Bach tensor condition, then it's actually this Shelton tensor. And then there is this uh, Rn conjugated with A term. But then there's this term. This term is this covariant derivative. This is I and J. Gradient I, gradient J. Gradient I, gradient J term. Okay. And so when scalar is equal to zero, that term is zero, then this Bach equation helps you to say this Shelton tensor satisfies an elliptic condition, and you can begin to get. Okay. So now the next observation is for Q flat metric. Even scalar curvature is not a constant, we can handle this term, gradient i, gradient j, r term. And that's because uh, when you do the iteration process, you multiply, you want to know the behavior of the function in a small ball, and then you have this aij, and you multiply by this term, multiply that equation on both sides, and then this term, and by this uh, Bianchi identity is gradient scalar square, and it's the same as Laplace R times R, and then our PDE is Laplace R equal to some curvature square. So that means that uh, you cross this gradient AIJ term, gradient AIJ term is uh, you multiply that equation by AIJ, and you integrate. So uh, mm, it's actually bounded by a cube. And that a cube is a square and a force to the one half. And now remember that we already control the Yamabe constant. Yamabe constant. So for the gradient a square, we have uh, bounded by some Yamabe constant times a force to the one half. So on this side, we have this uh, great, great Yamabe constant times A4 to the one half. So that means uh, when uh, the L2 known is small, you begin to get. Okay. So uh, that's the scheme. And in this case, we have totally geodesic boundary, so we don't worry about the boundary term. Okay. So the Ypsilon regularity theorem turns out to be have the following statement. You can begin to gain for all case power of the derivative. And then there is this, uh, suppose you start with some ball where the a square is small, you begin to gain. And then there is the g third power term on the boundary. 
that one is still there. So if you scale for GJ to GJ bar, such that this term is uniform, then you gain regularity. The curvature, once it has C1 bound, depending on how K you choose, it has C1 alpha. Okay. And that's the epsilon regularity property. Okay, so we know that uh, uh, we have epsilon regularity. And now we worry, remember, we, we have this curvature, we prove by contradiction, we have this curvature PJ, uh, the blower point at this curve. We need to discuss, discuss, discuss where does this point, uh, distribution of those points. So there are two possibilities. One is called a boundary blow up. So that means this, suppose this sequence of blow up points stay away from the S conformal infinity. It's a less, I'm sorry, uh, it doesn't go to infinity. PJ2 stays in an annulus of this thing. PJ OR here, um, fixed distance C on boundary. So, in that case, this PJ may gradually tends to a boundary point, okay? So, and then in this case, we have this. And so I already say, we already know this X infinity, the boundary is R3, okay? So in this particular case, we begin to use our second assumption that it is, uh, for example, the Yamabe constant tends to GC, all the vial L2 norm tends to zero to conclude that this limiting metric is, is hyperbolic. The vial L2 norm tends to zero, or, or you, uh, or it's the hyperbolic space because the volume of the ball is the same as the volume of the hyperbolic metric by this DJ inequality. And then here I skip some detail, you begin to pass into universal cover. And that universal cover is R4 plus, and you work on universal cover, you identify this metric as the hyperbolic metric. And now our test is to show your original Pfefferman grand metric in this limit case is the flat metric. So this is equal to rho infinity square. I write as equal to two W infinity square G infinity plus. So our test is to show this E to the two W infinity is actually is Y, the distance. So here we need uh, some kind of a real view theorem. So the real view theorem says, if in this case, I consider W infinity minus log Y, I call it U. I want to say U is zero, okay, U is zero. So why does that happen? Remember that this metric is Q flat, Q4 equal to zero. The W satisfies some force or the flat condition. And so is log Y. So if you look at the difference that Q4 condition becomes its by Laplace equation on upper half space. And then you look at its boundary behavior. Okay, there is some detail which shows U and gradient U and Laplace in U all equal to zero on R3. And then at this moment you think U must be zero, but it's not. If without an additional assumption, for example, u equal to y to the q power satisfy this first and this third condition. Okay. So it turns out the thing to get to the real theorem is the scalar curvature of the metric is also positive. So when the scalar curvature of the metric is positive, that's translate to this scalar curvature minus Laplace u minus gradient u positive. This this all are with respect to the flat metric. So the real view theorem says, in this case, U is identically zero, okay? So this is fourth order, there's three order constraint, not enough, but we have an interior blow up, yes.
Yes. Uh, these are in the interior, this is on the boundary. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, originally, you have Laplace interior tau u equal to zero, and then passing to Laplace u equal to zero on the boundary because u is already equal to zero. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so u equal to zero. Okay, so uh, that's the Liouville theorem. And this Liouville theorem, uh, we search the literature is proved by this uh, brother, Bao and Bao, Bao and Bao, B-O-A-R and the brothers. Okay, okay so it's flat. And it's uh, flat by Ibsen regularity contradict with uh, this uh, uh, Mm, point equal to the uh, same point equal to one. So there is no boundary blow up. Okay. And now we see why there is no interior blow up. So you worry that this point PJ gradually go to infinity. Okay. So that's called interior blow up. And then uh, in this case, uh, because it's not boundary blow up, this point PJ to the distance go to infinity. And then here you begin to see that our row J, when X is uh, uh, bounded away from the boundary can be compared to the distance function of GJ bar. Okay, so rho, rho J can be compared to distance function of GJ, rho J bar is this. So a little bit of elliptic PDE. So, uh, as uh, when x is far away. And then our scalar curvature is rho j minus two times this. And this is less than equal to uh, zero. I mean, gradient is uh, less than equal to one. So uh, that means our limiting metric has scalar equal to zero. And in that case, uh, it's also a Q flat equation. If you look at a Q flat, it becomes Risi equal to zero. And then uh, if you, at this moment, you can see that uh, uh, vial is equal to zero, so it's flat. Okay, so it's flat. So which contradict with this? And it's this step uh, which we need a little bit more work unless you already know this limiting metric is a uh, vial is equal to zero. Okay, so, so, uh, so that completes the proof. And once it has curvature bounded, you can uh, come back to control its diameter and uh, injectivity radius get compactness. So that finishes the proof. And now let me say that uh, why this uh, compactness theorem uh, in have a, uh, imply uniqueness theorem. So what does the uniqueness theorem means? The uniqueness theorem means that uh, they, this is one version of the uniqueness theorem. So on the three sphere, suppose our boundary metric is uh, C3 close, very close to the canonical metric. Then uh, in fact, if it's C2 close, we already know it has a conformal filling in. Okay, that's a grand, D and uh, Kobayashi, I uh, just uh, Kobayashi. Okay, so it already uh, exists. And then we want to say the metric constructed that way is also unique. Okay, in that neighborhood, it's also unique. So uh, uh, this is probably pretty standard, but let me say it a few words. So to see that uh, this metric G plus G had the interior construction is also unique. First, there is one constructed by Gren and Lee, but the way they construct it is this metric filling in of this G hat is in a neighborhood of the hyperbolic metric. So they use perturbation result. So their metric they constructed is in a neighborhood of GH plus by some kind of implicit function theorem. So the goal of us is to say 
by our compactness result, if this G hat has another conformal filling in, that conformal filling in has to fall in this small neighborhood of hyperbolic metric two. Okay, so that's the basic strategy. But then uh, there is a complication and due to this, uh, uh, this Einstein method equation is not uh, exactly elliptic and you need to place a gauge to make it elliptic. And uh, when, once you fix gauge, you need to consider the linearized operator. That's the Slishnowitz operator. And you look at the uh, coin is that for hyperbolic metric, that operator is uh, does not have a kernel. And you want to say you fall into that neighborhood by implicit function theorem. Okay. And this whole theory is uh, developed by Lee. Jack Lee in his uh, AMS memoir, but uh, there is also independent uh, uh, approach by Picard. Okay, so the key estimate we have is the following. Suppose we have two, given a G hat, we have two Einstein filling in. We want to say they are up to diffeomorphism in the same. But the information we know is they are Pfeffman grand metric both fall into a C2 alpha neighborhood of the standard GFG. So both up to diffeomorphism pull to this uh, standard metric GFG. Okay, uh, this uh, the metric I write down e to the one minus x square uh, dx square. They both fall into C2 alpha neighborhood. So they are C2 alpha close. And now there's an additional information. And since they are the compatification of Einstein metric, they have asymptotic expansion. They have the same boundary, okay? So, and that asymptotic expansion uh, recalls that uh, the asymptotic attention the first two terms are local term. It's only the third order term is a non-local term, you don't know. So that means they agree up to order OR3. Okay, so OR3. So that means that uh, uh, although they are C2 alpha close, their C0 known is less than R3, and this R3 makes you to be close to epsilon r delta for any delta between three and two. Okay, for any delta between three and two. And so that means this C2 alpha converges has a weight. That weight is r to the delta power. And that delta is for any number bigger than two and between three. And then, if one check the Einstein condition, you can pass from this converging to the GJ plus Einstein converging. And because the weight happened to cancel, this thing also converge in C2 alpha with respect to hyperbolic metric, the same weight. And if one check the theorem of Lee lemma 3.8, this is the range where you can apply implicit function theorem. And so apply implicit function theorem, you say one is uh, diffeomorphic, isomorphism poor to the other. So you have uniqueness, okay? So that's proof the uniqueness theorem. I think uh, that's what I plan to cover. If I have time, I can go to the next. What is my time now? Five minutes. Maybe I leave. Uh, either I can continue to cover the tomorrow's lecture. I, will, I may need more than ninety minutes, so I can do something. Do okay, sure. Yes, yeah. Okay, sure. So I stop here and. Uh, I'm really happy to be here in this nice conference. Uh, 
I'm learning a lot about uh, several uh, interesting geometrical problems. Uh, unfortunately, I will leave on Wednesday, so I apologize to the speaker on Thursday and Friday because I will miss their, their talks. And uh, today I will talk about uh, uh, log determinants in conformal geometry. Um, let me briefly recall uh, what I mean by log determinant. Uh, no, from here. Okay. No, come per andare in. Ah, dovrebbero funzionare. Ah, no, questi. Ah, okay. Uh, so let me briefly recall what is uh, the log determinant on a surface. Uh, in this case, we take uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator and uh, its eigenvalues. And in this case, uh, the idea is to define the log determinant as the, the, as the infinite sum of the log of these eigenvalues. Uh, since the, the eigenvalues uh, blows up, uh, in general, this formula doesn't make sense. But then uh, one define uh, this uh, zeta function, which makes sense uh, when the real part of S is bigger than one. Uh, then we extend this function uh, up to uh, S equals zero. And then we simply uh, define this log determinant, which really is a regularized log determinant uh, as uh, uh, minus the first derivative of, of this zeta function at zero. Uh, this way uh, of regularizing uh, uh, somehow has also some uh, physical interest because it is a way of reproducing uh, uh, a renormalization procedure in uh, some physical problems. Uh, so uh, somehow this type of, uh, of uh, the, the theory of determinant uh, has some physical interpretation. Uh, but let me focus on uh, the geometrical meaning uh, of, uh, uh, of this theory. Um, we, we have that uh, uh, when uh, we change conformally the metric from G to G at, uh, the log determinant changes accordingly to this formula. Uh, and uh, um, this is based on the conformal invariance of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And uh, um, a, a key fact is, the, uh, is uh, that the critical points of uh, the log determinant on a given conformal class with the fixed volume uh, re reproduce exactly uh, metrics that have constant Gaussian curvature. Uh, in general, uh, since you have a minus, uh, one can simply consider the maximizer of this log determinant. So this means that the maximizer of the log determinant are precisely uh, special metrics uh, that have uh, constant Gaussian curvature. And we will see that something similar happens also in higher dimension. Uh, this fact uh, has been used to study the uh, compactness of isospectral domains and surfaces. Uh, in, uh, in a series of papers. Oh, no. <laughs> eh, sì, però devo <laughs> seguire. Ok. Eh... So now let us switch to a four-dimensional manifold. In this case, uh, uh, we take exactly like the Laplacian in two dimension, we consider a conformally covariant operator. And um, in the case that the operator has no kernel, uh, under a change of uh, uh, a conformal change of the metric, the log determinant uh, changes uh, uh, accordingly to this uh, formula, uh, which says that uh, essentially the, log, the, 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 the conformal change of the log determinant is uh, uh, an universal formula with some coefficients depending on the specific operator we are considering. 
in terms of three universal uh, functional uh, I, double I, and triple I. Um, the typical example one can consider as, an as the operator A, uh, the conformal Laplacian, the Panetz operator, or the, squ uh, the square of the Dirac operator. Um, the, uh, the, the first and the third operators, namely the conformal Laplace and the square of the Dirac operator, are uh, good for uh, the discussion I will make in next slides. Essentially, what is important for these two operators is the fact that uh, the ratio between gamma 2 and gamma 3 for these operators uh, are bigger or equal than 6. And uh, we will see this is very important. Uh, apart from the specific value, really, uh, this is something that I want to emphasize for next slides, is the ratio, which is important. Uh, in the case of the Panetz operator, we will see uh, gamma 2 and gamma 3 uh, have opposite sign. Uh, so this is the bad situation. And we will see that something strange happens in this situation. So uh, what is the uh, shape, the form of this, uh, uh, of this uh, three functional, uh, three universal functional I, double I, and triple I? Uh, the first one uh, uh, involves uh, uh, the, uh, the vital tensor, uh, so is an L2 norm of the vital tensor. The second one uh, is exactly uh, the operator coming from the Panetz operator that uh, Professor Chang already mentioned uh, in her talk. And uh, the third one uh, is a strange expression that uh, one can understand more if uh, we see which are the, um, somehow, which is the correspondence between each of these functional and uh, uh, their, their critical points. So for example, for the first functional, a critical point is precisely uh, the, the W gives you the conformal factor uh, so that uh, the new metric with respect to this conformal factor is precisely a metric having uh, vial tensor square uh, constant. The second one, uh, as I already told you, is the functional associated to the Panitz operator. So its critical point uh, have uh, uh, Q curvature, which is constant. And the third one corresponds to having uh, the Laplace of the uh, scalar curvature uh, equal to zero in this uh, uh, new metric. Uh, okay, this computation is based uh, on the, uh, how the Panetz operator changes uh, under conformal change of metric. And here yeah, I recall the expression for the uh, Q curvature. And unfortunately, uh, there is the line. Uh, but in any case, uh, no. Ah, okay. Now you don't see the title, but you see the bottom. <laughs> no, but maybe. Uh, maybe if you can put it on the right, uh, there is a way. I don't think so. It doesn't want to go outside uh, all the borders. Okay, maybe when uh, the title is important, I will move it okay, on the no. bottom. Okay, uh, so uh, this is just to recall you that in four dimension, uh, we have a Gauss-Bonnet formula, but uh, that somehow tells you that the, the, the total curvature, uh, a combination of the total curvature and the total vial tensor, meaning the integral of the vial square, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is related to the Euler characteristic of the manifold. So somehow, uh, there is a, pres uh, a prescription on, the, uh, on a specific combination of, of the total curvature and the total vial tensor, but not on each of these terms. So in general, uh, each of these two quantities, the integral can take uh, uh, essentially any values, any possible values. And somehow this makes a, a large difference with respect to the two-dimensional case. 
where the, uh, we have a, a, prescri a prescription of the total curvature. And we will see that uh, uh, this causes some troubles. Now, let me write uh, for the full expression. So the, uh, I mean, the, the full expression is the uh, combination with coefficient gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three of the three universal function. And uh, let me write what a, a critical point is in this case. Uh, geometrically is uh, a, a metric, uh, it gives you a metric that has uh, some curvature uh, constant. And somehow this is uh, well expected from the two dimensional case. And uh, uh, this gives you uh, a special matrix where some, uh, some curvature uh, as a special value is constant. Uh, this uh, uh, U curvature is a combination uh, of the Weyler square of the Q curvature and the, the Laplace of R of the scalar curvature. So essentially is the combination of, of these uh, three uh, quantity appearing here. Uh, the associated conformal invariant quantity is the total U curvature. And then uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation associated to this operator uh, can be written in this form. Uh, you have a differential operator uh, calligraphic N, you have the U curvature, and uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, an exponential nonlinearity written in mean field form. But uh, let me focus uh, on the uh, differential operator. The differential operator, uh, is uh, this very ugly expression, uh, which involves uh, the Panetz operator, uh, the Laplace of the, uh, here you have a, a Laplacian square and so on. But uh, just to uh, understand a bit uh, how uh, the operator looks like, uh, let, uh, let's see which are the main uh, part in this uh, differential operator. You have uh, uh, from the Panitz operator and the, uh, from this Laplacian, you immediately uh, see a Laplacian square. But also uh, here you have the divergence of the gradient square, the gradient. And this is precisely the four Laplacian uh, of a function W. So these are um, the two main uh, part. And this explain um, the difficulty in the problem because the operator uh, is a, a fourth order operator because uh, here you have uh, four derivatives. Uh, is a mixed order because uh, uh, you have something involving four derivatives and uh, second derivatives. And it's quasi linear because uh, uh, the, the four Laplacian is a quasi linear operator. Uh, and uh, uh, no one of these terms can be neglected. Uh, so they, they scale in the same way. They are important and they have to, cons to be considered all together. So uh, what is known about the problem? Uh, there is a, a beautiful paper by Alice Chang and Paul Young, uh, where essentially uh, they can show the, the, the existence of extremals uh, uh, in general, because the, the gamma are negative, uh, uh, you don't consider minimizer, but maximizer. So really the existence of extremals uh, is existence of maximizers. Under this uh, uh, condition that the, uh, the total U curvature is below some uh, critical threshold. And uh, the meaning of this critical threshold is exactly the first threshold where you see uh, bluff phenomena to appear. So uh, this, uh, uh, this inequality somehow prevents you to have a uh, blow up. And this is why you can establish uh, the existence of a maximizer. And uh, then in the case when uh, you don't have, uh, uh, essentially the case in which you have just the Panetz operator, uh, which uh, uh, corresponds to the case where gamma two is a minus one, uh, you just need to impose the, the, their condition simply because a uh, condition the total Q curvature and the total Q curvature has to be less than eight pi square. But then um, in the case 
of uh, in, in which the operator A is precisely the conformal Laplacian. In this case, the gamma two is minus four. Uh, in this case, this number becomes uh, uh, 32 pi square. And uh, Matthew Gursky in uh, this paper showed that uh, uh, in a positive Yamabe class, uh, the uh, strict inequality providing the existence of uh, maximizer is always true except on the standard sphere with the uh, round metric. So somehow uh, this uh, uh, gives you a full answer in the case of uh, uh, the, the conformal Laplacian. But uh, unfortunately, and this is uh, related to the fact that uh, in the Gauss-Bonnet formula, you have a, a prescription, the sum of two, 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 of two terms. Uh, in general, you have that uh, um, the, 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 the strict or even the large inequality can fail. Uh, so somehow we want to go uh, beyond this uh, situation and uh, um, to look maybe for uh, critical points uh, uh, of subtle type. And in the case of uh, the Panetzi operator, this has been done by Andrea Malchiodi and Jadli uh, in this beautiful paper. Um, and the tool is uh, uh, first to, you, to have uh, uh, a compactness theory for the equation uh, considered. Then uh, some improved moser tudinger inequalities. And based on, on this, uh, uh, Andrea and Zindin had developed a min-max scheme to provide a saddle point. Uh, the idea is to follow uh, the same strategy for the more general operator involving all the three universal terms. And uh, now we, uh, we see that uh, the, the main condition is that the ratio is big or equal than six. And uh, in next slides, I'll try to uh, explain why it's important. Uh, so uh, the first part of the first theorem I state is a compactness result. So in the case of a sequence or solution which, may, which, uh, which do blow up, in that case, you, you can prove that the average goes to minus infinity and uh, the right hand side, the exponential part, concentrates as a sum of Dirac masses at several points in the, on the manifold. Once you have a, a precise description on how you lose compactness, then you can try and somehow this part is, uh, um, I would say, less interesting the first part because I follow exactly the same strategy as in the paper by uh, Malchiodi and Chadli. Um, once you have these, uh, you can uh, develop uh, improved moser trudinger inequalities and the min-max scheme to provide an existence result of uh, essentially a saddle uh, point, of a saddle critical point. Uh, once you have the, the total U curvature is not uh, a multiple of, uh, of, uh, of this value. So it's not a multiple of, of eight pi square times minus gamma two. N is the uh, differential operator, the ugly differential operator I wrote here. The Laplace four is, uh, can I write here? So in general, you have the, the P Laplace operator. Okay, maybe I, so this is the divergence of the gradient to power P minus two times the gradient. So here you have a gradient square times the gradient. So this is precisely uh, that operator with P equal four. Okay. Um, what happens on the standard sphere? Um, um, first, uh, in the case of the uh, conformal Laplacian, and uh, square of the direct operators, uh, one can consider F, which is the log determinant. Uh, there is a, a unique maximizer. Uh, 
for this to operate on the standard sphere. And uh, moreover, uh, um, this uh, unique maximizer is indeed the unique critical point for uh, this functional. Uh, here, uh, always uh, uh, what is important is that the gamma two and gamma three have the same sign. Uh, if we consider the a capital F, the log determinant associated to the Panetz operator, where gamma two and gamma three have opposite sign, uh, immediately also on the sphere, uh, this is uh, this result by Gurski and Malchiodi, uh, you have uh, non, uh, non, uh, non uniqueness. So you can provide uh, a different solution from the standard one. Uh, so this explains you why uh, in the case of the Panis operator, the conformal determinant, uh, the log determinant uh, is not uh, a good general theory because uh, you expect strange phenomena to, to occur. Let me say that uh, this result on the standard sphere, the asterographic projection can be rewritten uh, as a PD in R4. And uh, essentially, since you are, go you are coming from a problem on the sphere, uh, on the solution capital W, you are also prescribing the logarithmic behavior at infinity. So essentially, we, uh, you can rethink to the classification result that, that I wrote above uh, as a classification or solution of this PD in R4 with the given uh, logarithmic behavior at infinity. And, uh, and the solution are classified uh, as translation and dilation of uh, uh, this uh, standard solution. And uh, an interesting question might be, uh, instead of prescribing the behavior at infinity on the solution capital W, uh, a more natural condition, or, or let's say a natural condition is to impose some integrability on the exponential. And then to show that uh, once you have uh, a finite mass condition like this, then you have precisely logarithmic behavior at infinity. Um, okay. Um, let me consider a, a, a related problem where I keep uh, of the original uh, operator n just uh, the for Laplacian. So uh, I have the for Laplacian in dimension four, and in general, I can consider it also in, in dimension n. And then in this case, uh, the, uh, the operator becomes the n Laplacian, and one can address uh, uh, somehow, uh, one can address uh, uh, classification issues for the uh, exponential equation in dimension n under always the finite mass condition. Uh, somehow uh, this operator, uh, this problem is simpler than the one, uh, than the geometric one, but somehow keeps some of the difficulties because uh, it is still uh, quasi linear like uh, the calligraphic n that I wrote before. In this case, also uh, solution are known. There are explicit solutions that are translation and dilation of this uh, uh, specific function. And uh, what is important in all these issues is that typically you have uh, uh, that all these solutions have the same total mass. Uh, so you have a quantization of the total mass. And a uh, few years ago, I proved that uh, uh, any solution of uh, this. Uh, uh, PD, uh, P, capital P, uh, of this problem in Rn have precisely uh, the form of W of a translation and dilation of the capital W. Uh, in particular, we have that uh, a quantization result for uh, this, uh, for the total mass. And somehow uh, this is important because when you consider uh, a blow up analysis uh, by uh, looking at the solution very close to the blow up point, uh, you almost see these limiting problems. And once you have that the limiting mass is quantized, you can expect that also uh, the original problem has a quantization in the uh, blow up masses. And somehow this gives you 
uh, strong information on the blow up mechanism. Okay, this has already been proven in a radial setting, but uh, here the point is to show it uh, in a general way. A um, few words about uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, this problem. So I'm considering, uh, let me write here the equation maybe to, to keep it. So is the N Laplacian in dimension N and I require a finite mass condition. In dimension two, uh, the classification is known, uh, is very well known. It has been proved in, in uh, at least two different ways. First, uh, by uh, Liouville, uh, using the fact that the, the equation is integrable, so you have uh, uh, an explicit way of represent solution of this equation in two dimension on any simply connected domain. And then uh, in the case that the simply connected domain is the full plane, uh, you can use the Liouville theorem, and then you end up with the, uh, uh, the classification. Or you, you, there is also a PD approach to the same issue. And uh, this is based on the fact that uh, um, one can rewrite the, uh, the differential equation in an integral form. The integral form uh, has the fact that the, the logarithmic behavior at infinity is for free, that uh, in the quasi-linear case we will see is exactly uh, the real difficulty to show the logarithmic behavior. So once you have the logarithmic behavior in terms of the total mass of the solution, uh, plus the fact that uh, by an isoperiometric argument, you know that the total mass uh, has to be at least for pi, then uh, you can carry out uh, a, a simple moving plane approach to show the radiality and then uh, the classification. In the quasi-linear case, when n is bigger than two, uh, there are several difficulties. First, uh, uh, there is no integral representation because uh, uh, somehow uh, you lose, usually you represent by integrating against the green function. But in the quasi linear case, uh, you have a green function, but if you integrate against the green function, you don't get anything because you cannot pass the n Laplacian from w to the green function. And then uh, you don't get for free the logarithmic behavior at infinity. Uh, then in general, uh, you, you can lack the uh, comparison maximum principle on thin strips. So in general, uh, moving plane methods are difficult. And moreover, the equation is not invariant under Kernville transform that is, uh, usually is a, a very useful tool in, this, uh, in these issues. But then, uh, since we are in, uh, we are considering the n Laplacian in dimension n, that is something that is called the conformal case. Uh, somehow you have something uh, similar to what happens in two dimension. In two dimension, the positive identity is a very powerful tool, and somehow in the conformal case of the n Laplacian in R n. Uh, the positive identity is still uh, a basic tool. And uh, this has, uh, this has, uh, it has been already used uh, in the, these uh, papers. And then the idea is to try to use, uh, to classify the solution, the positive identity. Um, first, uh, I said that there is no, uh, that the equation is not invariant under Kelvin transform. But we have a Kelvin transform uh, under uh, the Kelvin transform W hat is simply W evaluated at X over X square. If you, uh, if you rewrite the equation for the Kelvin transform, uh, you get a weight, uh, one over x to power 2n in front of the nonlinearity. And unfortunately, you cannot uh, reabsorb that one over x uh, inside the, uh, the, the Kelvin transform. So that's why the equation is not invariant. Uh, so somehow you have the weight, uh, you have to keep the weight, and you have to work with the weight. So in this way, somehow uh, the, the, the issue about uh, uh, the logarithmic behavior at infinity becomes an issue at zero for the Kelvin transform. 
Um, let me say that uh, in n dimension, uh, the limiting situation is precisely when uh, the right hand side is in L1. In, uh, in my case, uh, the right hand side is in L1, but uh, you lose uh, classical results concerning the description of the singularity. So in general, uh, it's difficult to show that uh, the singularity is of logarithmic type uh, in that case. Uh, No, this uh, comes from uh, this condition. When you write, so is the total mass condition rewritten re in terms of the Kelvin transform. So the right hand side is an L1, but uh, uh, it's not enough to say that uh, it has a logarithmic behavior at zero. This is what we would like to prove. With some work uh, still using the fact that uh, the right hand side is not uh, a general L1 function, but uh, is uh, the exponential of the solution itself. So we are using that, uh, uh, we have really uh, an equation where the right hand side is uh, in terms of the function itself. Then uh, one can show that uh, you has logarithmic, one has a logarithmic behavior at zero. Once you know that you have a logarithmic behavior at zero, essentially you are saying that uh, you can remove the zero by adding uh, a Dirac delta at zero. So the original equation in Rn minus zero becomes uh, an equation in the full Rn. But then since somehow you, uh, at infinity, you have a sort of compactification because you can, uh, the infinity for the original function is zero. So it's something where everything is known. So somehow uh, this singularity has to be precisely the same mass uh, as uh, the, the function uh, uh, capital F appearing there. So this is why uh, this is the mass that, I, uh, that we have. And then once you have the logarithmic behavior, uh, if you want, you can go back to the original problem. So this means that you have uh, uh, the equation in Rn, you know the behavior at infinity, you write the positive identity on a large ball and you let uh, the radius uh, uh, to go to infinity and you get the classification via the posa F identity. A similar approach can be used also for the same equation when you add a, a singularity in the right hand side. In two dimensions, this uh, was already known. And in that case, uh, you, you also have uh, uh, essentially a sort of extension of the uh, Liouville formula. You have an explicit form for the solution. In the case uh, n bigger than two, uh, you have uh, still a mass quantization, but you lose the explicit form because uh, uh, clearly the two dimensional case is based on complex analysis and uh, in higher dimension, you lose it. Uh, let me see how much time I have, okay. Um, once you know uh, the, the, the mass of the limiting profiles and you have quantization, in general, you could expect to prove a quantization for the uh, blow up masses corresponding to looking at the same equation, for example, on uh, a domain of Rn. So uh, in this sense, I would like to address quantization issues in case of interior blow up. In general, you just know that uh, uh, the quantization, the concentration mass is bigger than uh, n omega n that in the two dimensional cases for pi, okay? No, sorry, sorry, no, uh, I say something wrong. Uh, in two dimensions, it's two pi. But then uh, if you can use, uh, if you have somehow, if you consider an equation where you put some potential and you have a good convergence of the potential, you can expect that the total mass is at least the mass of the limiting profile. So you use uh, uh, the blob scaling to show this inequality that in the two dimensional case now is exactly that uh, Concentration mass is at least four pi. Uh, four pi. Okay. Once you have that uh, the total mass, uh, the, um, the blob mass is at least four pi, you can ask, you can imagine that each blob point carries uh, a four pi mass coming uh, from the, the mass of the limiting problems. And if you can show that uh, in the intermediate region between uh, uh, the several blob points, there is no contribution to the mass, 
you can expect to have that uh, uh, the concentration mass not only is a multiple of, of four pi, uh, not only is bigger or equal than four pi, but is a multiple of, of four pi. And this is uh, uh, what has been show, shown in the two-dimensional case by Lee Shafir. They show that uh, the mass is a multiple of uh, four pi using uh, an Arnaic inequality of super plus inf type obtained by Shafir. Um, recently with uh, Marcello Lucia, we were able to extend uh, the, uh, the super plus inf inequality uh, to, uh, to this equation posed on a domain of Rn. And essentially you have that uh, given a compact set, you have that the maximum of the compact set plus uh, a multiple of the infimum on the full set is always controlled by above. Uh, here uh, in the two dimensional case, it is known that uh, the optimal constant uh, n minus one is exactly achieved, but we are not able to reach the optimal constant. And once you have uh, this uh, super plus infinite quality, then you can use it to show that you have, uh, in the case of an interior blow up, you have exactly what you expect. You have that uh, the concentration mass is an integer multiple of the total mass of the limiting problem. And so this extent, uh, the, the, um, the result by Lee Shafrir to, uh, to n dimension. Now let's go back uh, to the original problem. So the original problem, uh, I say that is important uh, the ratio between gamma two and gamma three. So now I'll try to explain why is important. Uh, so let's consider the linear theory for the operator N. Uh, clearly n is not linear as an operator, but I mean that I'm solving n equal a given function. And uh, since in general on the right-hand side, we just know that the right-hand side is in L1, we have to develop a linear theory when the right-hand side is in L1. So recall that uh, at main order, uh, the operator calligraphic n is this one. Now let's, uh, let's try to do some estimates. For example, let us test the equation against some function on of W minus its average. Uh, okay, the average is because uh, you are on a close um, on a close manifold. But in general, uh, so essentially we are testing against W, and we try to make some energy estimates. Uh, if you write uh, the full expression, still uh, you have an ugly expression because the original calligraphy can uh, is so. But then uh, let's uh, consider for the moment the case that phi is the identity. So we are considering really a test function like W minus its average. In this case, you uh, skip all the term with the second derivatives and you are left with something, uh, let's say the first term is alpha square where alpha is this number. Here you get something with, which is 12 uh, gamma three. And so this is uh, the 12 gamma three. And then you have a cross term that in general bothers you when you try to, to make energy estimate. But then this is simply a matter of uh, co completing the square. So in order to have the, the, the first and the last term control the cross term, you need that uh, two uh, times alpha times beta as to, as to uh, be bigger than the intermediate one. And if you write this, this, this becomes immediately a condition on the ratio gamma two over gamma three. And I refer to this case uh, as the coercive case, because in this case, if uh, probably this is a mistake uh, here, I'm saying W minus is its average. If the W22 norm is going to plus infinity, since somehow you don't have the intermediate term, so you have that uh, one of these two terms is going to plus infinity. So you have that uh, uh, NW tested against W is going to plus infinity. So you are in the coercive case. And this is good for many estimates. For example, one can consider 
uh, uh, this uh, uh, instead of phi the identity, one can consider this function. What is the property of this function? Phi is bounded. And uh, when you take K very large, the second derivative is, is, much, uh, uh, is much less than the first derivative. So somehow in each of the terms, you can neglect the presence of the second derivatives. And then essentially you get an estimate of this quantity since you can forget the cross term and somehow you, you are left with a multiple of these plus a multiple of the last one, both with plus sign. And then if you plug this quantity here, essentially you get the weighted W22 estimate. So in general, uh, like the Laplacian in dimension one, you cannot expect to get for F in L1, W12 estimate. The better you can hope is to have a W1Q estimate for any Q less than two, or maybe some W2 to a, some W1 two estimates. When you increase the dimension, the W1 two becomes the W2 two. The weight is exactly the derivatives of this function. So essentially is a one over W uh, square to power two over three. Yeah, exactly. But then immediately you, you can see that you can reabsorb the weight if you want to make estimate for Q less than two. So the, this uh, the, uh, weighted estimate gives you also W2 Q estimates for Q less than two, okay? And now uh, somehow you can, uh, usually in fourth order problems, you cannot make truncation of your function. This is yeah, sorry. No, you are using that when you multiply against phi, you have uh, that phi is bounded and f is uniformly bounded in L1. That, that's why it's important to have phi bounded. <laughs> okay. But uh, really the point in general, uh, you cannot allow truncation uh, for problem involving the bill application. This is a, a typical problem. Here, uh, essentially, I want to take a, a function which is more or less uh, the identity function. Then I don't truncate uh, with constant value, but I take something that goes to a constant value. So it's almost a, a, a truncation of the function. And uh, you can do uh, this uh, by taking k very large in such a way that uh, the second derivatives always can be neglected with respect to the first derivatives. And this tells you that the problem, uh, really the presence of this additional term coming from the four Laplacian makes the problem completely different from the Laplacian square. So this problem is much better because you, you can use truncation. And once you, you can use truncation, you can obtain estimate of this type, which are essentially uh, Cacciopoli type estimates. And uh, this Cacciopoli type estimate uh, can be used to obtain immediately, immediately, not completely immediately, but uh, to obtain a BMO estimates on the solution. So you can control uh, W minus its average on any ball. Really, in the original paper by Doltzmann, uh, Unger, Bühler, and Mueller, uh, they consider the n Laplacian in n, in n dimension. So it's not exactly our problem. And in their case, they can also establish uh, some weak uh, Lebesgue estimate for the gradient. Uh, here, we are not interested to this type of estimate. So uh, I, I pose this one like uh, open question. Probably uh, this should be true, but uh, somehow uh, we were not interested in. Uh, and why is it so important to have BMOs, BMO estimates? Because at some point we would like uh, to scale the problem and to have uh, some uh, estimate on the original solution that passes to the scaling. So we need uh, some invariant estimates and the BMO estimates uh, has this crucial property. Okay, clearly this would be true also for the weak Lebesgue estimates, but, sorry? The weak Lebesgue estimates uh, is uh, uh, something where essentially is uh, um, 
is a function, for example, this one, this means that the, uh, the gradient W is uh, in LQ for any Q less than four. And then somehow when Q is equal to four, you control something. Ah, no, sorry. The relevance of this question uh, is just for completeness uh, with respect to the uh, paper I was mentioning, because in their case, uh, they can show that the gradient is in L n infinity. And then in that space uh, for any uh, mm, for any right hand side, which is a bounded measure, not only they can show the existence in this space, but also there is uniqueness. So you have a unique uh, solution, which is in BMO and in the weak Lebesgue space. So for the result is crucial because they want to have existence and the uniqueness. In our case, uh, uh, we need some, uh, some estimate that uh, uh, we can keep track of uh, when making a rescaling. I think that how much time I have? Probably not too much. Okay. Okay, thanks. I go <laughs> a bit fast now. Uh, so uh, first we have uh, an epsilon regularity saying that uh, if you have a right hand side with an L1 norm, which is sufficiently small, then you have a good estimate on the Laplacian square and the gradient to power four. Uh, and this is the crucial point in order to establish the fact that when you have blow up, immediately you have uh, a quantization uh, or, or better a concentration of the mass of the exponential part because uh, the exponential part in the points where you, you lose the control has to have uh, a mass which is at least epsilon, okay? Now, a uh, few words uh, to explain you why, uh, because in the beginning I said that uh, the crucial condition is the ratio bigger or equal than six, non the uh, than two third than three half. Sorry. Um, the point is that now uh, in the uh, in the quercy case we were testing the equation against W in order to get essentially energy estimate. Now we want to test the difference. We want to take two solutions, W1 and W2, solving the equation, and we would like to get an estimate on the difference. So somehow we are requiring more. And if you write the difference between the equation for W1 and the equation for W2, and you test it against a general phi, you get this expression. So uh, the first two ter uh, three terms uh, are, um, are good terms, uh, but they are not written in the original metric G, but they are written in, uh, uh, in, a conformal, in a suitable conformal metric, depending on W1 and W2. Plus uh, you have some remaining term. And now let's see, the idea is that uh, uh, P, uh, the P written here is simply the difference. So essentially I would like to uh, test the difference, the, 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 the difference of the two equation against the difference of the two solution. In that case, uh, in order to, to get some estimate, we need that the, uh, the, all the main order terms are positive. Uh, clearly the, the, the first line, all the terms are positive, but then it's important the sign of this quantity. And this is uh, where the ratio bigger uh, or equal than six appears. Moreover, if you don't have, uh, if the ratio is precisely six, then uh, you also cancel these low order terms. And then in this case, you expect somehow that the problem becomes convex. And then uh, this is something that was already observed in the original paper by Alice Chang uh, and Yang. Uh, so in this case, not only you, uh, you have a convexity, you expect uh, uh, that you can solve the equation, uh, the linear equation with the right hand side they measure, and the solution is also unique. Okay, but in the case that uh, the ratio is bigger or equal than six, uh, still you can solve the equation. You have no uniqueness in general, and you, you have to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the difference is not an admissible function because uh, the, 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 the two functions in general are not in W22. 
So you have to develop some approximation scheme, but uh, uh, let me skip. And then you have precisely uh, an existence theory. In literature, you have uh, a lot of possible uh, uh, space where uh, to somehow to set the existence and the uniqueness theory. Here we use uh, this uh, strange space, uh, which is called the Grand Sobole space, uh, that somehow tells you, for example, let's uh, look at the gradient. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, my space W122 simply means that the, the gradient uh, is not exactly in L4, is in LQ for any Q less than four. And when Q approaches four, uh, the LQ norm blows up in a controlled way, okay? And in this space, uh, you can uh, develop the linear theory, and then you can get uh, a fundamental solution. So let's say a, a green function, something solving uh, the equation equal the right-hand side, a sum of Dirac masses, and the minus u, which comes from the left, because you have uh, n plus u equal uh, the exponential. Probably you have to finish. Okay. Uh, so you, you can uh, find exactly uh, the, the WS can be constructed with a logarithmic behavior. And then the point uh, is that uh, somehow you want to compare because when you make a blow up, you uh, the, yeah, somehow the, the, the blowing up sequence away from the blow up point goes to a green function. So to a function solving the equation equal this right hand side. And you would like to show that the difference between the function that you get and the fundamental solution that has precisely the logarithmic behavior uh, that is uh, somehow what you would like to prove, you would like to show that the difference is controlled. And uh, this is where you use the, uh, uh, somehow the, the argument that, that I, I was telling you. So you can make an estimate on the difference and you can show that uh, the, uh, the, the limiting function that you get from a blood procedure always differs by a, a fundamental solution, so a solution having a logarithmic behavior, by something controlled. And then somehow you can start with the Poisson identity. The Poisson identity on a closed manifold gives you quantization of the mass. So in this way, you show that you have quantization of the mass. Still, you have to show that the average goes to minus infinity, but this is a delicate point. Uh, maybe I just put the, the slide, but. Uh, so in general, there is a, an extra argument to show that the average has to go to minus infinity. And then in this way, you get the compactness part. So the first result I show you. The second result concerning the instance, as I said, there is a um, rather direct application of the min max method from the original paper of Andrea and Jadri. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Paolo. So, are there any questions? In Siren, Siren, statement of yours. Yeah, yeah, I will go back. Yeah, the results. I see. So, you are describing the proof of theorem one or theorem two? No, of theorem one. Oh, theorem one. This is, uh, I was trying to convince you that this condition is really crucial in order to make estimate. And then uh, if you take a, a sequence or solution that is making blow up. So this U is a constant? U is the, uh, the U curvature of the original metric. Okay, okay. So okay. it's given. And then exactly what I want to show is that the average goes to minus infinity and uh, you have a, uh, a quantization, a concentration of the right hand side as a sum of direct masses with quantized mass. And the quantization comes from Thank you. So gamma one doesn't appear. No, no, is irrelevant. Uh, well, let me ask, I'll ask you a more complicated question later, but the simple question is, 
so this is you're describing here what happens if you have blow up but uh do you believe that blow up can actually happen in general i mean do you think there's any possibility of like building multi-peak solutions that show that this I, can actually happen or I, I i imagine that the answer is yes uh in principle uh, you can have that uh, when you approach uh, when this integral uh, or better the, the mu n approaches some uh, uh, the critical value where you lose compactness uh, in principle you should be able to construct a blow up solution uh, clearly you have an idea of the main order term you have uh, this, uh, the corresponding standard bubble in this model right right so you have an, an, uh, an answer but typically all these theories uh, works well with the linear equation uh, because somehow you correct the answers uh, with a term that solves some linear equation, some linearization. Here, the linearization uh, clearly, clearly is not so helpful because the problem is quasi linear. So, one should understand how to use a, a perturbative approach that, in general, works well with the, the linear situation in this context. But in principle, I guess it is doable. So, but, but for your body, you can't do that, right? So, what, what's Oh, yeah, Mabe. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I, yeah. That's different, yeah. I mean, but with conformal invariance, I would guess that. I mean, of course, you have to understand this, but then yeah, you have to, there's no way to get existence without it. But okay, okay, okay. Now, for the geometric equation, clearly, I don't know the answer. But if yeah. you put an additional parameter, that's basically you can that play with it. Yeah. I didn't know if there was something special about the structure that you know. But was. still, it's not completely trivial because the problem oh, no, is no, quasi linear. Yeah. Uh, so, so far, uh, I never saw uh, this type of results in a quasi linear context, but it's an interesting question. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Do you have an understanding on how the solution, how the solutions depend on the parameter gamma two over gamma three? Uh, so you, you mean when uh, you approach six? Uh, no, everyone. So you have for each values of gamma two and gamma three, you have a solution. So is it possible to? Yeah, but the gamma two and gamma three somehow are prescribed by uh, the operator A you are fixing uh, so since the you, beginning. You change the, the, does the solution vary continuously, or do you have some? If you change. Uh, uh, I don't know. I would say that. Uh, uh somehow the the solution set remains compact as long as you are away from uh, uh, the critical ratio when you approach six maybe something strong could happen something strange could happen so thank you ah last question so I know everybody's hungry, but uh, yeah, I'm curious. Uh, so in, in that equation, two dimensions, if you add, uh, say, parameter alpha times the Dirac delta, then solutions are classified. Uh, and sometimes they're, uh, yes, sometimes they're radial, sometimes they're not. Is there any result of this kind uh, in? Uh, no, because uh, uh, as I said, in two dimension, and you know perfectly, uh, the Prajapat, uh, the result by Prajapat and Tarantello essentially uses uh, uh, the integrability of the Liouville equation uh, instead of, uh, of working on a simply connected domain on uh, a puncture domain. And so you have an explicit formula. Uh, then uh, you consider it on the full plane and then you get the classification. But for this result, the classification in two dimension, there is a no PD counterpart of that result. Uh, so even in two dimension, there is no classification without using complex analysis. And so it's not clear 
uh, what to do even in dimension two and in higher dimension is even more complicated. So probably you can just get the asymptotics, uh, the logarithmic yeah. asymptotics of the solution that, that you should be able to do. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, you have uh, uh, essentially you have the asymptotics, but uh, and also um, yeah, you can get the asymptotics. Uh, but the point is that uh, because typically uh, in two dimension, when a alpha is a multiple of four pi, uh, there are also no radial solution appearing for this equation in the full plane. Uh, when alpha is not a, a multiple of four pi, all the solution are radial. But it's very difficult uh, to see this different in higher dimensional case because uh, even in the two dimensional case, really you use uh, the explicit form that you have in hands and that, that is based on complex analysis. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thanks to you. Okay, welcome to this afternoon session. And we're gonna begin with a lecture by Dario Manticelli from the Politecnico of Milan. And his title is Rigidity of Critical Metrics for Some Quadratic Curvature Functionals. Um, thank you. And uh, first of all, I really want to thank the organizers, Giovanni and, uh, and Andrea uh, for this opportunity. This is the first workshop that I'm able to attend in person since this uh, whole, uh, COVID pandemic started, so I'm very excited. And uh, in the next uh, in the next few minutes, I will briefly discuss some recent results that were obtained in collaboration with uh, Giovanni Catino and with Paolo Mastrolia uh, concerning rigidity of uh, critical metrics for some quadratic curvature functionals. And uh, the problem is to study uh, some canonical Riemannian metrics, canonical, uh, arising as solution of uh, Euler-Lagrange equations uh, associated to some curvature functionals which are quadratic in the curvatures. And uh, just to start, um, we can recall the, a paper uh, published in 1970 by Berger, uh, where he computed variations of uh, some curvature functionals, among which uh, variations of a quadratic curvature functionals and provided applications to this formula. There are, uh, so the literature is huge, so I will for sure miss something for which I apologize right now. But uh, there are also several surveys concerning these topics, uh, uh, among which I want to mention the book by Besse on, uh, on um, Einstein manifolds, uh, uh, a survey by Smolensev in uh, 2008, and a recent book which have uh, been published by uh, Giovanni Catino and Paolo Mastrolia not two years ago. When talking about uh, curvature functionals, of course, one has to recall the Einstein-Hilbert functional, which is given by the total scalar curvature on the manifold. So you have a Riemannian manifold with a Riemannian metric G. Uh, RG is the scalar curvature and the H is the notes of the functional. It is well known that when the manifold is compact, uh, Einstein, metric arise, um, Einstein metrics arise as uh, critical points of H uh, were restricted to the space of a uh, smooth ma uh, matrix on, a, on the manifold having total volume equal to one. Or alternatively, one can uh, modify the functional, uh, the functional renormalizing it with, uh, with the right power of the volume. Uh, just to fix the notation, MN will be uh, an n-dimensional uh, manifold without boundary of dimension two or more. Uh, RIM will be the Riemann curvature tensor, uh, W the Weyl tensor, Rich the Ricci tensor, and R the scalar curvature associated with the Riemannian metric G. And with this notation, uh, a basis for the space of quadratic curvature functionals uh, is given by, for instance, these three functionals, W squared, R squared, and uh, S squared, which are uh, uh, respectively the total integral of the square of the vial, or the, of the, of the square of the norm of the vial tensor, the total integral of the square of the norm of the Ricci tensor, and the total integral of the scalar curvature squared. Uh, of course, if, any, if uh, in low dimensions, the situation is uh, simpler. In dimension two, for instance, you only have S squared as all the uh, information on the curvature is encoded in the Gauss curvature. In dimension three, the vial tensor vanishes, and so you have only two of the functionals, R squared and S squared. Uh, dimension four is peculiar. You can see it in several ways, but uh, for instance, when M is compact by the gauss bonnet formula, you can recover, you can so basically recover uh, W squared from the other two 
uh, since, uh, except for uh, an, uh, a constant which depends on the topology, so they have the same critical metrics. And uh, in dimension four or higher, another interesting functional, quadratic functional, is the one given by the total integral of the square of the norm uh, of the Riemann curvature tensor, but you can recover it uh, as a linear combination of the other three, of course. Uh, so just to declare what we are doing and what we are not, uh, in, our, in, our, in our study, we, we focused our attention on functionals which do not depend on vial squared. Uh, and uh, specifically in dimension three, for t in a suitable range that we will see in a, in a while, we consider the functional f squared t, which is a linear combination of r squared and uh, s squared, uh, t being the parameter of the linear combination when you normalize to one the coefficient of, uh, of r squared. While in all dimensions larger or equal than two, we consider the functional uh, s squared, uh, which if you want, you can see it as a formally as corresponding to the functional f squared t when uh, t is, uh, is plus infinity, quote unquote. Uh, now it's standard. You can use variations with compact support and check the Euler-Lagrange equations satisfied by critical metrics. And for uh, the functional f squared t uh, in local coordinates, the Euler-Lagrange equation reads as follows. So it's a system basically in the components um, of uh, differential equations uh, having uh, derivatives of the Ricci tensor, the full Riemann tensor, derivatives of the scalar curvature. So it's, it's quite involved. Uh, but if you trace it, you get a, a nicer equation. So you have a constant times the uh, Laplacian of the scalar curvature equals to a term, uh, which has the square of the norm of the Ricci tensor and the square of the norm of the scalar curvature time a coefficient that vanishes in dimension, precisely in dimension four. Um, just for later reference, uh, when t is larger or equal than minus one over n, this term is non negative. Uh, critical metrics for the functional S squared satisfy um, their proper Euler-Lagrange equation, which looks simpler than the one for the functional F squared. So you have R times the Ricci tensor minus the Hessian of the scalar curvature is equal to R squared times the metric times a coefficient. And if you trace it, you get a nice differential equation for the scalar curvature. You have that the Laplacian of the scalar curvature is R squared times a constant, which again vanishes when n is equal to four. And you can see also from here that the dimension equal to four is special. In fact, a large part, a large part, I mean, a good part of the literature concerns critical metrics for specific values of T and, uh, and n, uh, n equal to four being really relevant. Uh, let's briefly discuss the compact case. So here you have the two functionals that we're considering, ft squared and s squared. Uh, if the dimension is not four, the functionals are uh, not scale invariant. Uh, so it is natural when studying them to restrict, uh, to, to look for critical metrics uh, restricted to the space of uh, smooth metrics having unit volume on the manifold or equivalently, as we already said, for the Einstein-Hilbert functional, you can renormalize the functional using suitable powers of the, of the volume. Uh, Ricci flat metrics are critical for, uh, for F squared T and are global minima when T is larger than minus one over N, while uh, scalar flat metrics are of course minima and, and so in particular, they are critical points for uh, S squared. Uh, every Einstein manifold is critical for this functional, for F squared, for every value of T when restricted to the space of a matrix having unit volume. Uh, and uh, while in dimension four, every back flat matrix is critical for the particular value T equals minus one third. Uh, actually, it is an if and only if uh, in dimension four. Uh, in dimension four also, uh, matrix which are, which are um, which have vanishing by tensor and uh, zero scalar curvature are, are critical for this functional F squared T when t is equal to minus one over four. So for this specific value, you have also these examples. Uh, an explicit example of a critical metric for a square of minus one over four that has been, has been constructed by La Montaigne uh, in the case of the three-dimensional sphere. And uh, the example constructed is non-Einstein. And uh, Gursky and Vyaklowski uh, generalized proof that this construction can be carried out also in the case t larger than minus one over two. Uh, in 2016, they constructed uh, also examples of non-Einstein critical metrics for the functional F squared in four, dimension, four dimensions. 
uh, when the manifold is uh, as a specific form. So it is the connected sum of some compact uh, Einstein building blocks. And the value T is related to the topology of the building blocks uh, uh, that you use to construct the manifold. As I already said, uh, there is a huge literature concerning rigidity of critical metrics, uh, uh, concentrating on specific values often of the parameters. N equal to four is really appreciated and is equal to three also. Uh, and conditions usually are of pointwise or integral type uh, and are conditions on positivity or negativity of certain curvature or either pointwise or, uh, or uh, as a total integral. And uh, I'm citing here some of the of, uh, some papers, but uh, so a work of La Montaigne in 1994, a work by Anderson in 1997, and a subsequent work in 2001, uh, from which we draw upon to, to prove our results. Uh, a work by Gursky and Vyakloskin in 2001, where they studied, if I remember correctly, the case n is equal to three, the sigma two curvature, which corresponds to the value t equals minus three over eight in dimension three. Then a work by Chang, Gursky, and Yang, uh, where they proved, where they studied rigidity of uh, backflat matrix. Uh, recent works by Lebrun, uh, a work by Catino, where here he studied minimizers of uh, of, uh, of of some of quadra the quadratic functionals, like one of the two I can't remember which is about uh, the total uh, integral of the square of the norm of the Riemann, the full Riemann tensor, for instance. And uh, a result by Catino in 2014, uh, from which also we will draw upon to prove our results, uh, and uh, a work, recent work by Brozos Vasquez, Garcia Rio, and uh, Cairo Oliveira. And uh, again, I, I mean, uh, the literature is huge. I apologize for any reference that I for sure will have missed. Uh, but uh, moving on to, the, to, cons to, to studying critical metrics for the functionals, uh, again, in the compact case, uh, in dimension four, if one does not renormalize the functional and, and just seeks to minimize the, the, the functionals uh, as, as they are, uh, it's easy to see by integrating the trace of the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, by, by checking, uh, yeah, by integrating the Euler-Lagrange equations that uh, the critical metric for uh, F squared, uh, when T is larger than minus one over N, must be Ricci flat, while critical metrics for S squared must be scalar flat. Uh, in dimension four, you don't need to renormalize as the functional is already scale invariant. And uh, you can see that critical metrics of either functional have harmonic curvature because in the equation satisfy, if you trace the Euler-Lagrange equations, you will have Laplacian of the scalar curvature times something equals N minus four times blah. So when N is equal to four, it's, uh, the, the scalar curvature is harmonic. So it's constant since the manifold is compact. And uh, if you're considering critical metric uh, for S squared, you can use the, 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 the full Euler-Lagrange Euler equation of the satisfied by the matrix and, and see easily that either the matrix is uh, scalar flat, or if it's not scalar flat, it is actually Einstein with positive scalar curvature. So let's move on to the case of uh, complete non-compact uh, matrix. Again, these are the functional we are considering. And again, uh, Ricci flat matrix uh, are critical for this functional for all values of T uh, and are in particular global minima when T is larger than minus one over N and uh, scalar flat matrix are minima of the functional uh, S squared. Now, this is a result of Anderson that we will use later on. Uh, he showed that uh, in dimension three, when the scalar curvature is non-negative and G is critical for the functional F squared, for specific values of the parameter that is either t is equal to zero or t is equal to minus one third, then the manifold is flat. The Ricci tensor vanishes identically. Uh, Giovanni Catino uh, proved a sort of counterpart of this result in uh, dimensions n larger or equal than three, showing that if the scalar curvature is non-negative and g is critical for the functional S squared, then it must be scalar flat. Uh, Catino, Mastroli, and myself, uh, we, we, we studied the case in, uh, n equal to three scalar curvature non negative, and G a critical matrix for uh, F squared, where the, the value of the parameters is a minus three over eight, which is related to the total sigma two curvature functional. For this, for this specific value in three dimension, uh, critical matrix for the functional F squared are a critical matrix for the total integral of the sigma two curvature of the, of the manifold, then the manifold must be Ricci flat. Uh, and all these results, as you can see, rely on, on uh, sign assumptions on the, on the curvature of the manifold. 
Uh, there are explicit examples of uh, metrics uh, for F squared T in case n is equal to three and uh, T equal minus three over eight, which is again the case of the sigma two scalar curve, the um, sigma two curvature functional due to Gursky and Vyaklowski. Uh, they studied the compact case in this paper, but uh, they provided also uh, examples uh, uh, which, uh, which are uh, uh, on manifolds which are complete and non-compact. So which apply in this case. Uh, just as a remark, the, the curvature is negative and it is non-integrable to any power because basically you have three variables and uh, the scalar curvature depends only on two. So when you integrate in the third, the integral diverges. Oof. Uh, T equal minus three over eight. Uh, okay, it's formal. So if you don't have, if you don't have using compact variations, so if, if, the, if the total energy is finite, then it makes sense, uh, I mean, as, as uh, integrating on the whole variable. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's, uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations are derived integrating variations with compact support. Um, when, the functional is, uh, when the dimension is equal to four, uh, the functionals are again scaling invariant. And uh, if t is equal to minus one third, uh, uh, a matrix is critical for the functional if and only if it is back flat, you can check this by direct computations. Uh, since in this case, you cannot directly use the gauss bonnet formula. So there are several well-known examples in the literature. In particular, uh, Kian and Vyaklowski studied the back flat matrix uh, in the non complete non-compact case uh, with finite energy. Uh, again, in dimension four, when, the di when t is not minus one over three, uh, you can check the equation and again see that the scalar curvature of the metric, if it is critical for either functional, uh, must be harmonic. So if you add the hypothesis that the matrix is critical, okay, but it, is, it has an integrable scalar curvature to some power, then the scalar curvature must be constant by a result u to yau. And if you're considering only the functional S squared uh, from the fact that the matrix has a constant scalar curvature, you can check the Euler-Lagrange equation and see that it is either scalar flat or it is Einstein with negative curvature and given the integrability assumption, uh, it must also have a finite volume. So we will basically no longer discuss the case n equal to four since basically you have these results. So we have uh, basically four theorems that I will briefly discuss and uh, I will also uh, go through the proof very quickly, to the proofs very quickly. So we have uh, results for the functional S squared in all dimensions uh, skipping n equal to four and a result for F squared T in dimension three. Of course, the results become, I mean, are uh, stronger in low dimension and become uh, uh, weaker as the dimension uh, increases as one might, might expect. So the first theorem is uh, this one in uh, dimension two. So you have a, 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 a Riemannian surface. Uh, so two dimensional, a, a complete critical, me critical matrix for uh, S squared, which is the only functional that you have in two dimensions. Uh, and uh, in this case, the, um, the, the, the surface must be flat. And, and so in particular, a global minimum of the functional. And uh, a nice feature, as I, as I told you, the results are stronger in low dimensions. Here, we do not have any assumption on the, on the manifold or, or the curvatures. The idea of the proof is that uh, basically to check the Euler-Lagrange equation, which for S squared is fairly reasonable. And uh, in two dimension, it reads as, as you see written here. So the Hessian of the scalar curvature is proportional to the, to the background metric. Mm, there's a constant times R squared. Uh, so basically M2G is a gradient conformal soliton and the potential function is precisely the scalar curvature, which is a very strong condition on the manifold on the metric. Uh, and the, the proof proceeds by contradiction. If G is not flat, then one can see that uh, the, sc the, the scalar curvature actually depends only on one variable, quote unquote, which is it depends only on the sinus distance from one of its regular level sets. And uh, this one dimensional function, uh, if you check the Euler-Lagrange equation in the direction orthogonal to, the, to this uh, regular level set, uh, you see that R must satisfy this ordinary differential equation, which is fairly easy to study uh, on, a, on a maximal domain, uh, S lower star, S, S upper star you can basically do a quite standard qualitative study of this ordinary differential equation. And, and you can see that all solutions basically fall into two families. Either the, the non-trivial solution has no critical points 
and then the maximal domain is a half line, unbounded above or below, but it, it's an half line, or the solution as uh, the non-trivial solution has precisely one critical point, and then the maximal domain is a bounded open interval. Uh, this is in contradiction with the hypothesis that the matrix is complete, because if you don't have any, if you don't have any critical point, the, the, the maximal domain should be a full line, unbounded above and below because you should, you should be able to let S go to plus infinity and to minus infinity by the completeness. While if you have a, a, a solution which has only one critical point, the maximal domain should be a half line. And there are no solutions with this property. So uh, you reach a contradiction and thus the scalar curvature should be identically equal to zero to, from the start. So basically it's an ODE argument that gives you, that gives you the result. Uh, so moving on to dimension three, uh, if you have, so the, the only result that we have for critical matrix for the functional F squared. Uh, so three dimensional manifold, a, a critical matrix for the functional F squared with T between minus one over three and infinity, minus one over three in three dimensions, of course is minus one over N, which is the value that, that uh, keep appearing. But, uh, in this hypothesis, the manifold is flat, and, and, and thus, in particular, it's a global minimum for the functional. And also here, we do not have any assumption on M and on its curvature. The idea of the proof is that it essentially follows two arguments due to Anderson in those two papers that I already cited in uh, 1997 and 2001, and an application of uh, the Omoriyao maximum principle on the scalar curvature. So we, we need these two lemmas. Uh, the first one says that if you have a critical metric for F squared T, T different from minus three over eight, which is again, the value related to the sigma two, to the total sigma two curvature. So if you're not in that case, there exists a complete, uh, and the matrix to start is non-flat, then there exists another non-flat critical metric for the functional on a different three-dimensional manifold, uh, which moreover has also uniformly bounded curvature. So you can find another solution which has the same properties as the one that you already have, but the norm of the Ricci tensor is uh, bounded above by one. It's a blow up argument basically. And uh, this lemma was basically proved by Anderson in 2001 uh, in the case T equal zero, and it draws upon uh, a previous regularity result in the, the, in the other paper in 1997. You, you blow up. Okay. Yeah, and the blow up argument, you have a problem of regularity of the limit and uh, the, the, the regularity result is another lemma. I mean, it's embedded, of course. It's another lemma which he proved for T equal to minus one over four. Um, and the second lemma is, uh, is this one. If you have, a, a, again, a complete uh, metric, which is a critical metric for F squared T, uh, in this range, so t larger or equal than minus one over three with no negative scalar curvature, then the manifold is flat. The case I wrote here t equal to zero, but I should have also added the t equals minus one third. Those values are due to Anderson uh, in, his, uh, in his paper in 2001. Uh, but you can check that the proof can be adapted for the, the other values of t. So for t different from minus three over eight for the first uh, lemma and the t larger or equal. Uh, then minus one third for the second lemma. With, uh, with, this, uh, with these two lemmas in end, you can prove the theorem fairly easily. Uh, so assume by contradiction that you have a solution which is non-flat and uh, T is in the correct range. Then by the, first, uh, by the first lemma, you can construct another critical metric which has uniformly bounded geometry. Uh, if you check the trace of the Euler-Lagrange equation for this new metric, for the scalar curvature of this new metric G, you find a nice differential inequality. Uh, the Laplace of the scalar curvature is controlled by a constant times the square of the scalar curvature of this new metric. And uh, in this range, the, the, the constant happened to have the right signs. So this is positive, this is negative. And, uh, and so you can use the Omori-Yau maximum principle to show that the infimum of the scalar curvature should be zero but then the scalar curvature is non negative and the second lemma kicks in. You have now a solution with no negative scalar curvature, which must be flat. But the, 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 the metric G bar was non flat from the first lemma. And so you reach a contradiction and, and, the, and you conclude the proof. So the starting metric should be flat. 
So it, it draws upon the results by Anderson plus this application of the Omari Yao maximum principle. The corresponding result for critical metrics in dimension three for the functional S squared is, is, is actually weaker uh, since we need to require an integrability assumption on the scalar curvature. So we are assuming we have a critical metric for the functional S squared in dimension three, but we need to assume that the scalar curvature is integrable to some power. Then the metrics is scalar flat. And uh, in particular, a, a finite energy assumption is sufficient. So in case Q is equal to two, everything is fine. And uh, here we have no sign assumptions on the scalar curvature. And uh, the idea of the proof is basically to show that even if you don't assume any sign condition on the scalar curvature, by the integrability assumption, the scalar curvature should have the correct sign. And then you use a result that's already available in the literature, basically. And uh, the way in which you can show that uh, the scalar curvature is non-negative is a test function argument. So assume that there's a point where the, the, the scalar curvature is negative, then you can consider the set of points where the scalar curvature is negative inside the ball of radius S. And then you can test the trace of the Euler-Lagrange equation with this test function here. So it's the absolute value of R to the power Q minus one times eta squared integrated on this set. Uh, and the cutoff function is a standard cutoff function being equal to one on the ball uh, of radius S, zero outside the ball of uh, twice the radius and controlled gradient. And you perform standard estimates to get to this, to this, uh, to this a priori estimate, where basically this term is finite due to your integrability assumption. This term goes to zero because S tends to plus infinity. So it forces this to be equal to zero, which in turn forces R minus to be identically equal to zero, which is a contradiction with the, your uh, initial assumptions that there was a single point where the scalar curvature was negative. So the scalar curvature must be larger or equal than zero. And uh, the result follows by a previous result available in the, in the literature uh, by Giovanni Catino, who showed that under these assumptions, actually in any dimension, the, the, um, the, the, the scalar curvature should vanish identically. Sure. Oh, it, it's, it, it, you may have point, I mean, in principle, you can have that the scalar curvature is negative on some parts of the manifold, which run to minus infinity, I mean, to, to, to infinity, which are, I mean, um, this set alone could be unbounded. Yeah, it could, it could, it could. Um, uh, here, because you're you're integrating against. Yeah. Okay. So if if this is bounded, then here you find a fixed set, but this goes to zero anyway. So this goes to zero. This forces this to be equal to zero, and uh, so basically either r is equal to zero or the gradient vanishes, and so. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for the question. And uh, so basically you prove that the R should have the correct sign. And then the, the, the previous result by Giovanni in 2014 kicks in. Uh, it, basically it's another test function argument, but uh, it shows that the scalar curvature vanishes identically. And so you have a global minimum of the functional. One might wonder why you need to, to, to have this integral. I mean, from the argument, it is clear that you need this to be finite. So, but, but uh, one could wonder why don't you use the Anderson's technique also in this case? And uh, the point is, if you try to perform the same argument to reach a contradiction and you perform the blow up argument. So basically what you, what you, what you can find is a blown up manifold, which is non-flat uh, bounded geometry, uh, critical for the functional, but you don't obtain a manifold, which is flat, but only scalar flat. And, and, and so you don't have a contradiction between these two properties. It is non-flat and scalar flat. While in, the, in Anderson's argument for the other functional, it was non-flat and Ricci flat, which gives a contradiction. This doesn't happen in this case. So it would be nice to remove the integrability assumption. For, for instance, in the theorem by, by Giovanni, when R is non-negative, 
uh, and critical, and the matrix is critical, it 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 has scalar curvature that vanishes uh, without any integrability assumption. So if you have a sign assumption, you can uh, you can avoid having integrability assumptions. So it would be nice to remove the integrability assumption even in this case, but we were not able. So uh, this is the result in dimension uh, three. In a dimension higher than, uh, than, well, dimension four is special. We already discussed it. In dimensions five or higher, the result is weaker still. So we have uh, um, a result for critical matrix for the functional S squared under several assumptions though. So you have an integrability assumption. Not all Qs fit the theorem. So there exists a critical exponent Q star and you want your, your scalar curvature to be integrable to some power between one and Q star. And moreover, you need the scalar curvature to be bounded from below. Under these assumptions, then it is scalar flat and thus a global minimum of the functional. And um, in particular, a finite energy assumption, assumption is sufficient because this exponent is larger than two. So the case Q equal to two, which is finite energy is included in this theorem. And also you have no assumptions on the sign of the scalar curvature. You do have several uh, assumptions, which one might want to remove, which is boundedness from below and a suitable integrability assumption. Uh, here, the proof is a little bit uh, more involved than the preceding cases. And it is articulated in, say, just to, 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 to give a scheme in, in four steps, basically. The first step is a test function to show that the scalar curvature must actually have a sign under these, these assumptions. And the, similar to the argument uh, that we perform in dimension three for critical matrix of a squared, here there's a term that changes sign. So you can prove that the scalar curvature in this case is actually non-positive. So it's smaller or equal than zero. By checking the, oil, the, the trace of the Euler-Lagrange equation on the scalar curvature, you can see that it satisfies the maximum principle. So by the strong maximum principle, if it is non-positive, it's either identically equal to zero, and then we are done because it's what we're trying to prove, or it is strictly negative on M. And in this case, you, 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 I mean, we go, we go on and we perform our proof. So from now on, suppose that the scalar curvature is negative and define F to be minus logarithm of the absolute value of the scalar curvature. Okay, now this is a little bit annoying, but uh, this is the one Bakri-Emery Ricci tensor with potential function F. It's defined in this way. So it's the Ricci tensor plus the Hessian of the potential function minus uh, DF tensor DF. It's defined in this way. And if you check the um, Euler-Lagrange equation satisfied by the, by the metric G and you perform all the computations and all the transformations, you can see that this tensor is equal to a minus a constant times C to the minus F, okay? And if you take the trace of this, or if you take the trace of the original Euler-Lagrange equation and compute the, 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 this, this quantity for F, uh, you can see that the F Laplacian of F is this constant times C, which is positive for N larger or equal than five, times E to the minus F. So it, it has a sign. Uh, one, interest, one interesting, I mean, uh, here is where the boundedness from below hypothesis on the scalar curvature kicks in. We need the, the boundedness from below here. The one Bakri-Emery Ricci tensor is always bounded above. This is positive, this is negative, so it's always bounded above, but we don't really care about this. Uh, if R is bounded from below, this quantity is bounded from below. So the boundedness from below, from below hypothesis on the scalar curvature gives you that the one Bakri-Emery Ricci tensor with potential function F is bounded from below. And uh, when, the Ricci when the Ricci tensor is bounded from below, you have Laplacian comparison and the Mori-Yau maximum principle. If the one Bakri-Emery Ricci tensor is bounded from below, you have similar results for the F Laplacian, which is this operator here. Uh, given that uh, Bakri-Emery Ricci tensor is bounded from below, you have this result are, comparis are the F Laplacian comparison principle. So the F Laplacian of the square of the distance is controlled by a constant times another plus another constant times the distance. And uh, where B is the distance from a fixed reference point. And you have the full Omori uh, Yao maximum principle for the F Laplacian uh, as shown, uh, well, the F Laplacian comparison due to Kian, Kian hope the pronunciation is correct in 1997 and by Wei and Wiley in 2009, while the Fulomori-Yau maximum principle for the F Laplacian 
was proved by under this hypothesis uh, was proved by Paolo Mastrolia and uh, Rimoldi in 2014. Uh, now, the first step now is to prove, well, the second, since we already showed that uh, the scalar curvature is non-positive, uh, is um, a gradient estimate in the spirit of Yao uh, when, uh, when considering uh, harmonic functions uh, on uh, manifolds with no negative Ricci curvature. Uh, that is the gradient of, uh, of the scalar curvature squared is controlled by a constant times R, R squared, where the constant depends on the dimension and then on uh, a priori upper bound uh, on the lower uh, on the lower bound of the scalar curvature. Uh, the F Laplacian has a corresponding Bochner formula, which I wrote here just you know for completeness. So you have the square of the norm of the Hessian, uh, a term involved in the inner product between the gradient of the F Laplacian and the gradient of F. Uh, the one bakri emery ricci tensor evaluated along the gradient of F, and then a, a power four of the gradient of, of the function f and uh, you perform your usual uh, your usual estimates estimating from below this with one over n and uh, you get that this whole expression uh, is controlled from below by a positive constant times gradient of f to the power four minus this coefficient times gradient of f squared now if you knew that the the the, the, the gradient of f uh, the the norm of the gradient of f uh, achieved its absolute maximum, at that point, this would be non-positive. So you would have that uh, the gradient of F squared is controlled by this quantity. And this quantity is bounded above uh, by the infimum of the scalar curvature if you, do all the, if you trace back all the transformations. So you would be done and you wouldn't have anything to prove. But of course, you don't know a priori that the gradient of F assume, uh, achieves its absolute maximum. So you have to perform a, a, a technical argument using cutoff functions, which are, uh, I mean, uh, use the distance to, 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 to cut off the, 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 the function. And uh, in that case, since you're computing the F Laplacian of the distance, you need the F Laplacian comparison that I cited before. So here is where you use the F Laplacian comparison. In either case, you find that the basically something like here through more involved calculations, you have that the gradient of F squared is bounded, uh, which if you trace back the transformation, you get back to the scalar curvature gives this bound. This, bound. this gradient estimate is not enough for our purposes. We need a, a refined gradient estimate. Indeed, we claim that the, the square of the gradient of R is controlled by a constant times R to the power three. And the constant is independent of, of, of everything except the dimension. So it's an absolute uh, constant, dimensional constant. Uh, so we need to, to raise the power from two to three. And uh, here it's where the argument becomes a little bit more involved. I'm not going into the details, but um, basically you introduce the function V, which is A times the absolute value of the scalar curvature minus gradient of F squared. And A is a positive constant that you have to choose later. Uh, you want to show that V is non-negative. Non if V is larger or equal than zero, then, then you have that the gradient of F squared is controlled by A times the scalar curvature, transform back to the scalar curvature and you have this. So you want to prove that V is non-negative. Non and in order to do this, uh, you want to use the omori yao maximum principle. V is bounded from below because absolute value of R is non-negative and the gradient of F squared is bounded uh, because, of a previous, uh, because of the previous argument, the previous gradient estimate. So this function is bounded from below. You have the omori yao maximum principle due to our remark on the one bakri emery ricci tensor and the result by Paolo Mastrolia and Rimoldi. So you can use uh, the omori yao maximum principle and get to the conclusion that actually the infimum of V is non-negative uh, if you choose A in a, in a, suitable, in a suitable interval. And I, I mean, again, I'm not going through the details, but it involves uh, a refined uh, estimate from below on the Hessian uh, when, you, when, you, when you use the Bochner formula. Uh, so you get that V is, non v is a larger or equal than zero, which gives you that the square of the gradient of F is controlled by a universal constant times the absolute value of R, transforming back to R, you get you get this estimate. Uh, from this, uh, uh, you have an a priori estimate on the behavior at infinity of, of the scalar curvature. So if the scalar curvature is negative, uh, it must be 
say bounded away from zero by this function. So it, 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 it's smaller than a sum constant uh, over divided by the distance from a fixed reference point to the power two at infinity. Uh, and this follows just integrating the, the refined gradient estimate along a geodesic. You perform the integral and, and you get with, uh, and you get, and you get to this estimate fairly, I mean, in, in a standard way. Now uh, I'm getting to the conclusion. Uh, the conclusion follows from a test function, from um, again, a test function argument, which is where your integrability assumption kicks in since we, we, we never used it uh, until now. So you, you consider the trace of the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is a differential equation on the scalar curvature. It's basically Laplacian of the curvature equals constant times R squared. So you, you, you test the equation against uh, the absolute value of the scalar curvature to the power Q minus two times a, a, a cutoff function eta squared, which is a standard cutoff being equal to one on a ball of radius S, zero outside a ball of twice the radius and with controlled gradient. You perform your usual calculations with your uh, favorite Young inequality and you get to this a priori estimate. So you have a universal constant, Q minus two, where Q is the integrability exponent. Uh, Cn is the constant coming from the refined gradient estimate. And uh, here you have something which is bounded on S uh, times the integral on, a, on an annulus of uh, the same power of the scalar curvature. And this is true for, for all S. Uh, and in order to get to that estimate, you need to use both the refined gradient estimate and the, the decay estimate at infinity for the scalar curvature. So it's quite sharp. You have to, to, to use both the results. Uh, as I said, the CN is the constant from the refined gradient estimate. Now, let me get back. So if, you, if R to the right power is integrable, this goes to zero. And if this is positive, it forces R to be identically equal to zero. The argument is fairly simple. Uh, you, have, you just have to solve this equation in Q and, and you find the explicit expression of the critical exponent Q star, which happens to be larger than two. It's basically, uh, well, basically it's this one. I will get to this in a second, but uh, you get this, this, this estimate. So R should be identically equal to zero. It's a contradiction with our assumption that R was negative. So the scalar curvature was zero to start from the start. And this concludes the proof. Uh, now, as I said, this uh, is the, the value that we found. It's two plus something, which is, it's positive if you check. Um, quite likely, it's not optimal, but it's, uh, it's this bad due to the refined gradient estimate. The smaller CN is, the, the larger this, this, this thing is. But uh, the, the, the argument showing the refined gradient estimate is fairly involved. Um, so it's, 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 it's almost for sure non-optimal giving raise to this horrendous number. And, uh, and, and, and with this, I, 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 I can conclude. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Critical equation, you use two equations. You use the, 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 the global Euler Lagrange and the trace ones. Is there some um, rigidity result when you only assume the trace one? Um, I'm, so I would say, uh, so I would say no. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I don't know, maybe someone can, can, can prove it, but uh, from, from just from the technical point of view, uh, here you need to use the full, what is it? Here you need to use the full equation in order to, to, to ensure that the one back the Emery Ricci tensor is bounded from below. Otherwise you don't have the Laplacian comparison and the omori -Yau maximum principle. So this is where you use the full equation. You use it only, <laughs> yeah, in the Bochner formula, but I mean, oh yeah, sure. Of course you use it also in the Bochner formula when computing. So uh, you need it very heavily. And uh, also in lower dimensions, uh, you use it all the times. For instance, in dimension two, you check the full equation in the direction orthogonal to, to, to start the ODE argument. I'm not sure whether you can do it just with the traced equation, but we weren't able with this, with this approach at all. So I would say no, but... Other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Um, where do you use uh, the full strength of the Moriyama principle? So the gradient condition, is it crucial or uh, think you could? Yes, because when, so uh, here, I mean, I, I'm, I didn't really cheat here, but uh, I, I say I, I skip a, a few passages. When you do, when you do the same argument here, um, you use uh, an improved lower bound which holds only at points where the gradient of f is not zero. Uh -huh. And uh, so the, the, the equation, that the, the terms that appear have the gradient of v appearing all over. Uh -huh. And uh, um, where the gradient of v is equal to zero, you can relate the gradient of r to the gradient of the gradient of f squared. Of course, there is a correction term which goes to zero, but uh, you need it in order to be able to pass from the gradient of R to the gradient of F squared in, in several places when, when doing the estimates. Okay. Actually, here I'm saying that the contradiction argument, a contradiction argument is uh, runs on the fact that when you when you find the sequence of points of the Omori-Yau points, say, um, you want to show that along those points, the gradient of F goes to zero. Yeah. So the contradiction argument is suppose that the gradient of f along those points doesn't go to zero, then blah, 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 blah. And then you use the, 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 the actually the full Omoriyao and not the, the, I don't know how to call it, weak Omoriyao. Weak Omoriyao. Okay. Yeah. okay. But it, it's, 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 it's of capital importance basically to pass from one to the other. Okay. Because it's not because the, for the global version of the gradient estimate of uh, Yao Cheng and Yao, uh, for the global version, you you actually have proofs that do not need the full Omoriyao. For your improvement at the second step, it would be nice to find whether uh, they could, you could have, uh, avoid this. And this may go also in the direction of the question that Professor oh. Caron posed. Using only the trace instead for, of- For weak Omoriyao, just uh, to guarantee uh, weak Omoriyao only need a volume growth condition and not, uh, so maybe the full Ricci condition is not, is yeah, avoidable and something can be reached only from the scalar from the equation for the for the Laplacian of f. Of course, here you can improve. So if you only assume a, say a, a, a condition on the behavior of the scalar curvature at infinity, say it, it can go to infinity to minus infinity, but not faster than. Probably here you can find something which which sees and the this, behavior of the of the scalar curvature at infinity, and that. you can maybe trace all the steps and see what changes. But we, 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 we didn't do that. I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen if you, if you allowed a controlled explosion from below of the scalar curvature. Okay. I, I cannot, I, I don't, I mean, I would have to go through the proof once again. Okay, thanks. There was a, another question over here. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you. If you if you strengthen the assumption about the uh, scalar curvature bounded from below to some other curvature bounded from below, like sectional or Ricci, do you think the other assumptions may relax, or uh, the argument is somewhat blind to this uh, strengthening? Uh... Because maybe maybe there you could use the standard Bochner formula for de Laplacian in that case. I don't, I don't know sure. if this helps or not. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know what I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, okay. I don't know the answer. Uh, no, I, I don't know. We thought a little bit about you know removing this this boundedness from below, weakening it directly, but not replacing Same it with thing. other okay. with other assumptions. I don't know. Okay, and I have another very fast question. In the three-dimensional case, yeah. you. Uh, assume the uh, yeah uh, scalar curvature integrable in that range. That, uh, do uniformly bounded scalar curvature suffice to provide this uh, this uh, result, or it's um, important the Q is smaller than the no, infinity? I, think Q, I mean, for the argument, it's it's uh, <laughs> it, it requires Q uh, finite. I'm not sure if if going through another route, you can include the case Q equal to infinity. But uh, the proof that we have requires Q strictly larger than one and, uh, and uh, finite, say, not Q equals to infinity. I I'm not sure if one can take another route and, uh, and uh, find another proof that, that goes through with that hypothesis, but this breaks down. It, it must be, 
for sure adjusted in some way, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it cannot be fixed with only that assumption. Because for example, the constant in front of the second integral. Yeah, you're saying Q goes so to infinity. It, this it seems kills, to help, but uh, no, it no. kills the constant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure. We didn't really, we didn't really think about this. Uh, like placing Q equal to infinity, it doesn't help. But um, there's might there might be a, a, an argument that that that, 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 that could work, but not this direct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Big. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's uh, let's thank Dario. That's it. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get started with our our next lecture. But before doing so, I, uh, a, a quick announcement. So this evening there is a social dinner. Uh, the correct time is eight o'clock. That's the time that's given in the schedule uh, that you received in your folder. However, the time at the website says eight thirty, which is incorrect. All right. So the correct time is eight o'clock this evening. Okay. Any questions, you should certainly ask the organizers many times. No, they'll explain it to you. Okay, so uh, for our next talk, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, online, at least, a uh, good friend, Paul Yang from Princeton, who will speak on the CR3 sphere. Okay, so I would like to thank Andrea and Giovanni for the invitation to the conference. Unfortunately, I had some difficulty, so I cannot travel. So I still take this chance to present uh, our recent work about the CR3 sphere. So let me uh, first uh, outline what I plan to talk about. So the first item, of course, to talk about what is the uh, CR structure on a three manifold. And then I was briefly talk about global invariants. And these are analog of the Yamabe equation and the Q curvature equation for conformal geometry on four manifolds. So that you can be, if you don't know CR geometry, you can at least have some rough idea what's going on. So I want to recall conformal four manifolds, uh, these equations, as well as the connection to the Gauss-Bonnet formula. Now, the, in CR geometry, an important question is the embeddability of the underlying CR structure. And then we introduce a twist. In addition to embeddability, we want to talk about what is universal embeddability. Uh, the whole idea is trying to circumvent a difficult example called the Rossi sphere. Okay. And then the rest of it is gonna be a uh, application of Perlman's work on three manifolds. You see in CR geometry, there is a curvature flow. It's, it's a flow developed by Jack B and Ji Xin Chen. You call it the Cartan flow. Unfortunately, it's a fourth order equation. It's uh, very difficult to tackle analytically. On the other hand, we still try to make use of the you know, basic uh, geometric finiteness theorem. And we extract some uh, simple result about the sphere theorem. And this is the main thing that I want to talk about today. Okay. So as I say, our work on the CR3 sphere is mainly motivated by the conformal four sphere theorem, the earlier work of Alice Chang, Matt Gersky, and myself. That briefly can be summarized this way. Namely, if you look at a four manifold, uh, compact with non-negative Yamabe constant. And then you look at the, the two key components in the gauss bonnet integral, 
The first one is the total Q curvature, and the other one is the L2 of the vial. So if the first integral dominates the second one, then we have the following conclusion that uh, first of all, if uh, M is diffeomorphic to a quotient of the standard structure on S4. The second case deal with the case when the total Q curvature is zero, then the conclusion is that this four manifold will be conformal to a quotient of S1 cross S3 with the product metric. <clears throat> and then finally, if the four manifold has zero Yamabe invariant, then the manifold is conformal to a flat torus. So it's the analog of this result that we're looking for. Okay. So now let me uh, begin talking about uh, what is a CR structure. So it's basically a three manifold N3 with a contact form theta. So theta is called a contact form. It's a one form if theta wish D theta is never zero. So now you have a volume form and therefore a uh, orientation. Now the kernel of this contact form, C is called the contact plane. And then we want an almost complex structure, J, so that J squared is minus one. So if you think about it, this is all basically almost no restriction on what we can get. Okay? And then let's denote uh, by D sub B, the restriction of the Duran D to the contact plane to C. So we write D sub B, and then with the almost complex structure J, we can decompose D sub B into round D sub B plus round D bar sub B. Now in higher dimensions, there is an integrability condition that is you can always impose the condition that D bar B square should be zero. But in this low dimension, this condi condition is vacuous. And that's in fact what uh, makes everything goes wrong in this dimension, okay? So let me uh, start by talking about the local invariants. So the local invariants are the following. First, uh, let's talk about the dual vector field called the Reed vector field. I denote it by T, and it's uh, characterized by the following two conditions, namely theta, the contact form on T should be equal to one. And then you further require that D theta, and if you plug in T into the first component, you should get zero. And such a condition uniquely determines this re vector field. And then we extend this to be a local frame uh, it's called a T and Z sub one and Z sub one bar. So Z sub one is the one zero type vector field and Z sub R one is it's, uh, conjugate. And you know the dual by theta and theta upper one and theta upper one bar. And we want to normalize things so that D theta is I times H one one bar times theta one, which theta one bar. So if uh, we're talking about a strictly pseudo convex CR structure, then H11 bar is positive function. So with this framing, then there is the Tanaka-Webster connection. So I write the connection with the connection one for omega one one. So the nabla of Z sub one is omega one one tensor Z sub one. And then the other condition that characterizes this connection is that the re vector field should be parallel. So uh, once you have this, this connection, then of, of course you can differentiate the connection one form. But before I do that, we notice that D theta upper one can be written as uh, let's see, let me use my, okay. so a theta upper one wedge omega one one. 
And then there's a torsion term, you know, by ACE, upper one, lower one. So the torsion, unfortunately, is, is almost always present. And in fact, it's the, the main item that we're always trying to deal with. And then uh, if you have this connection one form, then you differentiate it, D omega one one, you pick up the what's called the Webster scalar curvature. And then of, of course the covariant derivative of the torsion also appears in the structure equation. So the important thing here is the following. These are the only local invariants of the CR structure in this dimension. Okay, let me see, um, did I miss anything? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now let me try to start talking about the global quantities. So the main thing is the analog of the Yamabe operator. We call it the CR Yamabe operator, <coughs> denoted by L sub theta. So it's basically the sub Laplacian. Uh, so the sub Laplacian is basically given by this quantity written as u sub one one bar plus u sub one bar one. Okay. And then you add to it the scalar curvature over four. So the CR Yamabe operator satisfy the following transformation rule when you change the contact form theta by V squared times theta, then the new CR Yamabe operator associated to the new contact form is related to the old one by this equation. Of course, you notice that this is exactly the same transformation rule as the Yamabe operator in conformal four dimension. <coughs> And then of course you can define the CR Yamabe invariant by trying to minimize the Sobel quotient. In other words, you try to minimize L times U times L theta U integrate subject to the condition that the volume associated with new contact form is the same as the original one. <coughs> So an important operator we call the CR Penis operator <coughs> denoted by P. So it's a fourth order operator. So it differentiate U once and then further differentiate with this complicated expression and then differentiate once more. So it's a fourth order operator. And it has exactly the same transformation rule as the Penny's operator in conformal geometry of dimension four. <laughs> and then this Penny's operator is closely connected to the Puri harmonic functions. The Puri harmonic functions are by definition locally the real part of holomorphic functions. And in this dimension, uh, it turns out the set of Puri harmonic function actually third, satisfies the third order equation. We call it the P3. So it's this third order derivative of U should be zero. And then the Penny's operator is just differentiating this expression once more. <coughs> Therefore, the Puri harmonic functions denoted by script P is always a subset of the kernel of the Penny's operator. <coughs> so the, oh, let me see, I forgot something. Yeah, okay. No, no that's okay. And then uh, the Penny's operator actually defines the force order curvature invariant. But as you'll see later on, that curvature invariant is always trivial. So what's needed is really an analog of the fourth order penny operator with a CR structure. And this is called a P prime operator. So this is something that uh, uh, Jeffrey Case and I uh, figured out. 
it's really uh, after the idea of Tom Branson. We call it the P prime operator. So it's got this complicated expression. So it's basically the sub plus square and then plus further correction term and further correction term involving this quantity W1. So the W1 by definition is the first derivative of the scalar curvature minus I times the first derivative of the torsion. That will explain uh, the importance of W1 first, but the, the Penny's P prime operator satisfy this complicated transformation rule. That is in conformal geometry, you will not have this extra term, but in CR geometry, we have this extra term. And this is the original force of the Penny's operator. And this term uh, causes uh, some difficulty with manipulations. Okay? But uh, now what is this uh, W? Well, W1, is of course closely related to the Q curvature, namely its divergence is basically the force of the Q curvature and the Q curvature is transforms by this rule, okay, which is not difficult to compute. But the earlier work of Charlie Pfefferman, when he began to look at CR structures, he introduced the following equation. Nowadays, we call Pfefferman's equation. That is, if the manifold is a boundary of a strictly pseudo-convex domain in complex two-dimensional space, then you look for a suitable defining function for the domain. And defining function is u. The level set of u is going to be the boundary. And you solve this equation, this Montier pair equation, determinant of this Montier Montier pair determinant should be equal to one. And then uh, the observation here is the following: if you have such a defining function u, then you take uh, d bar b of log of u. You take it as a good contact form then this contact form would have Q curvature equal to zero. So this is uh, found out or pointed out by Jack Lee, that is W1 equal to zero or the divergence W1 is, is Q. Jack was the first one to point out the contact form given by Pfefferman's equation satisfied the pseudo Einstein condition. Okay. Okay, so the, it's in fact the pseudo Einstein contact forms for which is we can construct global CR invariants. Okay. Now, with the introduction of the P prime operator, we can introduce the Q prime curvature according to this formula. So this Q prime curvature of this contact form is basically this expression which looks very much like the Q curvature in conformal geometry in dimension four. And the transformation rule for the Q prime curvature is given by this complicated formula. Now, let me just uh, put it in the box. So the important thing <clears throat> to point out here is that the total Q prime curvature is a global invariant. It is, it is closely connected to the topology. Namely, if the M is now the boundary of a complex manifold, X, which has a Kähler Einstein metric denoted by G plus, then a uh, constant, I think, I'm not sure if this is probably 16 pi square, times the order number of X is given by two integrals. The first one, is a integral over the complex manifold. This is a churn number. Okay. It plays the analog of the vial square. Okay. And then the other integral is the boundary integral on the manifold M, and this is the Q prime curvature. So this formula points out the importance 
of the Q prime curvature, okay? So let me now talk about the embeddability condition. So it turns out that the an abstract CR3 manifold is embeddable provided the following is true, namely the fourth order penis operator is non-negative and then the Yamabe constant should be strictly positive. Uh, this is a work of, by Shanilo Chu and myself. And then Takuchi proved the converse. That is, if M3 is embeddable, then this fourth order penis operator is non negative. So the main example of interest here is the Rossi sphere. So this is a uh, deformation of the standard structure on the standard S3. So if we take Z1 and Z1 bar to be the standard vector field on this S3, we make the following change. That is you take Z1 upper T to be Z original Z1 plus T times Z1 bar, where T is a real parameter strictly less than one okay? or greater than minus one. This, extra, this structure is known to be non-embeddable. However, it's Z2 quotient, that is RP3, with this CR structure turns out to be embedded in R3, uh, sorry, in, in complex three-dimensional space. And its scalar curvature is computed this way, namely it's two times this quantity and it's strictly positive. As you can see, as T tends to plus or minus one, it tends to infinity. And the Q prime curvature is computed by this quadrant, okay? So notice that the Q prime curvature is non-negative if the quantity T square is, is smaller than this number, which is roughly one over 14. And then if T square exceed this number, then the Q prime curvature becomes negative. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the main example to keep in mind. So basically to circumvent this example, uh, we invented this term, namely we say the three manifold is universally embeddable if every finite cover is embeddable. So the quotient of the Rossi sphere is not universally embeddable and we want to rule it out from consideration for now. So I wanna remark that the Rossi sphere is actually one of the homogeneous CR structures studied by A.D. Katan. And there's a recent write-up by Bohr and Jakobowitz, basically because Katan's paper is difficult to understand. And tell this work uh, explain quite a bit what Cotton did. Okay. okay, so now I want to talk about the the result. Okay, so when we avoid this type of example, the Jeffrey case and I have the following conclusion: that is, if the three manifold CR structure is universally embeddable. And if the total Q prime curvature is strictly positive and the Yamabe invariant is strictly positive, then we can say the three manifold or the CR structure, not the CR structure, just the contact structure. So N3 with the contact form is contact diffeomorphic to, to the standard S3 module of finite group. On the other hand, if the three manifold or M3 theta J is embeddable, and both these invariants vanish, that is total Q prime curvature is zero, and the Yamabe invariant is zero, then M3 is contact diffeomorphic to a compact quotient of the Heisenberg, okay? As I say, uh, the proof is mainly based on Perlman's geometrization. It's basically a topological argument. So, let me outline the argument, okay? So 
first of all, uh, it is well known that all three manifolds have residually finite fundamental group. So the residual finiteness is a technical condition, but for us, it simply means the following. Namely, if the fundamental group is infinite and is residually finite, then for each integer n, there is a finite connected covering of m of degree at least n. In other words, if the pi one is infinite, then you have an increasingly large sequence of covering of m. Okay. Now, <clears throat> once we assume that is the CR structure is universally embeddable with positive Yamabe invariant and the total Q prime curvature positive, then in fact, we prove that any finite cover of M has degree strictly, I'm mean, sorry, has degree less than or equal to 16 pi square over the total Q prime curvature. So this is really a consequence of the work that uh, Andrea Macchioli, uh, Chi Xin Chen, I saw, uh, worked on previously, namely under these assumptions, we have the existence of the minimizer of the Sobel quotient for embeddable CR structure M3 with positive Yamabe invariant and Q prime curvature greater than zero. Then using the transformation rule for Q prime, you plug in the Yamabe contact form, you can easily see that the total Q prime curvature is less than or equal to 16 pi square. In fact, you will get the equality if you're only if it's standard three sphere. So with these uh, two observations, then we conclude that if M3 uh, structure is compact and universally embeddable with positive Yamabe invariant, then we have a finite fundamental group. Okay. So now we appeal to Perlman's work. We have the geometrization. That means that the M3, in fact, is uh, first of all diffeomorphic to a finite quotient of S3. And then we use the work of Ediashberg, who classified this contact structure on S3 into two types. The first one is the standard one. And the other one uh, is basically called un not tight. And the, not what the standard one, only the standard one can, can bound a complex manifold. So <clears throat> we have the conclusion that it, the, the contact structure is the standard one. Okay. So this proves the assertion one. Assertion two is entirely trivial. Namely, if you plug in uh, the contact form with zero scalar curvature, then look at the Q prime curvature. So Q prime curvature integral is this quantity. And this, since the scalar curvature is zero, you will pick up the obvious sign, okay? Therefore, the conclusion is if the Q prime curvature integrate to zero, then the torsion must be equal to zero. Then you go to its universal cover, which has zero scalar curvature and vanishing torsion. So according to Sid Webster, it must be the same as the Heisenberg. Okay, okay so I'm actually going a little bit too fast, but that's okay. So I want to tell you about an alternate argument to step two, that is, the hard work involving the positive mass theorem. And that actually can be avoided. And basically, this is because of the corresponding result of Maskey, Matt Gursky in the conformal four dimensional case. Namely, his observation is the following If you blow up the four manifold by the Green's function of the conformal Laplacian, so in our case, we blow up the uh, 
we blow up the contact form by G squared times theta, where G is the Green's function for the conformal Laplacian. Okay. So that means uh, conformal Laplacian applied to GL is basically 16 times delta function at the pole P. So now what I'm talking about is actually not quite true. That's why there's this uh, funny asterisk. <clears throat> but let's pretend it's true. Let's go over roughly Gursky's idea. So let's let, uh, so in CR normal coordinates, let L upper zero denote the conformal Laplacian of the Heisenberg. So the CR normal coordinates means that we try to approximate the manifold by making conformal change of contact form so that near a point, it looks as much like the Heisenberg as much as possible. So L0 is the conformal Laplacian in the Heisenberg and P0 is the Penny's operator in the Heisenberg. Then we observe that the P0 prime, so P0, so let me say, sorry, P prime zero, that is the P prime operator of the Heisenberg satisfied the following simple property. That is you apply it to the log of Green's function, then it's equal to A pi squared times the Sago projection. So the Sago projection is the L2 projection to the Puri harmonic functions. So GL is basically one over two pi times rho square. So remember now this rho square rho to the fourth power is basically mod z to the fourth plus t squared. Okay. So it requires the analytic work to show that the green function is actually up to this leading order term the bound of function. So the hard work involves the CR normal coordinates, okay? And then uh, we calculate P prime applied to log GL. So we have that uh, if the leading term is A pi squared times the Seiko projection plus these correction terms, and then plus, P prime of log of this quantity. Okay. There's another bound of function here. Okay. So we conclude that P prime log GL is basically A pi square Seiko projection plus a bound of function. That is, we need to check that all of these function, all the remaining part is a bound of function. And in addition, Fourth of the P Penny's operator applied to log GL square is actually A pi square times delta function minus Sago projection, okay? Plus another bounded function. And finally, we check that the P3, the operator that defines Fourier harmonic function applied to log GL is vanishing toward the row. So notice that the Q prime curvature associated to the, the new contact form is minus four times the torsion A hat square. Okay? Then the transformation rule gives us this long and complicated formula. But what you observe from it is the following. You integrate this expression, then you get the conclusion that the zero is equal to 16 pi square minus total Q prime curvature minus this positive term. And then this non-negative term here, we're use, using the observation that the penny operator is non-negative. Therefore, you get the conclusion that total Q prime curvature is less than or equal to 16 pi square. So now, as I said, uh, I cheated a little bit Namely, the CR normal coordinate. Uh, when you construct the CR normal coordinates, 
there is a preliminary change of contact form, which may not be pseudo Einstein. So the previous computation really cannot be done with the CR normal coordinates. So they are actually done uh, using the Moser normal form. So remember, uh, most churn and Moser, when they start looking at the CR structure, they provide a normal form that is uh, local embedding that is for a CR structure with a given point P, you can realize this, say in this you know, special case, CR3 manifold, then M is closely approximated by this hyperquadrant. So this is basically, this is basically the hyperquadrant and with an error term. And then the error term, uh, you know, the by E has the following expansion in terms of the coordinates uh, U plus IV and the variable Z. So E is basically C42, the function of U times Z to the fourth Z bar square, plus its conjugate, and then plus C33 of U, Z3, Z bar Q, plus error up to mod Z to the seventh. So with the CR normal coordinates, we redo this computation and do the corresponding expression to show that the, all the errors are bound to function, then you, you get the correct formulation, okay? Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Are there questions? Um, hello. Um, hi, Paul. Um, do you have ex Yes. Um, okay. Um, do we have it? Do we have examples uh, of three manifolds uh, for which the integral of Q prime is uh, very large, so maybe as large uh, as one wants. I actually no. <laughs> no, not in the positive conformal class. Yeah. So. Yes. No. So no. I, I mean. Yeah, probably negative conformal class. So in uh, yeah, in, in the Riemannian case, uh, you typically take products uh, of negatively curved uh, surfaces. Yeah, and, uh, then, then the, if you are willing to extend negative, then of course there are many examples. So let me just, uh, so the previous uh, is, uh, is rigorous, but let me just speculate a little bit on what should be done when we want to confront this family of Rossi examples. So if you remember the calculation, uh, uh, let's see. So if you remember the calculation for the Rossi example, the, the total Q prime curvature is always negative. I mean, the less than or equal to 16 pi square. So our speculation is that uh, when you minimize or when you are able to solve the analog of the sigma two equation. And then you follow the, so instead of the, you know, is, instead of the reach shift flow, you follow the flow devised by uh, Jack Lee and Ji Xin Chen. 
it is already known that under the flow, the total Q prime curvature actually increases. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you can show without proving the convergence that the total Q prime curvature, you know, especially when you get close to the standard three sphere should be less than that of 16 pi square, then you have a global argument. So what I'm suggesting is basically the following. That is, one should be able to solve the CR uh, sigma two equation. In fact, there is work going on uh, by several people. So first of all, uh, this young man, Ravi Shankar, is able to prove the analog of evans creed law or the sigma two equation. So once you have a C11 estimate for the sigma two equation, you know you've actually got a smooth one. So that was the key technical difficulty that uh, you know, stopped us from working on this problem. So once we know that uh, there's no real difficulty in the evans law of argument, then uh, we have done some previous work with Jixin Chen and Jeffrey Case. I think it's very likely we can sort this out. Okay. As I say, this is all speculation because even the evans law argument has not been entirely written out. Okay. So that's my uh, comment, speculation, yeah. May I ask another one? Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, yes. Um, um, uh, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask also whether uh, non tight structures on a tree may carry positive uh, scalar curvature. Important. If you take non tight structures on a tree. Do they carry positive uh, scalar curvature? Oh, I haven't studied that at all. Uh, you should yes. probably ask Jeffrey Case. Okay. I think he thinks that uh, may be possible, but uh, but I haven't asked him for for precise information. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Paul Claude here. Oh, hi, Claude, how are you? Oh, just great. Um, I, I was wondering about, uh, so th there was some point I, I didn't understand. So when you're trying to eliminate the overtwisted uh, contact structures, um, you use a global embeddability statement, but I'm just wondering where that comes from be, be, with the hypotheses you've got since the things that aren't even locally embeddable are, are, are dense. Uh, how is it you you know that the the thing is is globally embeddable just given this uh, Webster scalar curvature hypothesis? Well, we are assuming it's universally embeddable. Oh, so, okay. So that was an explicit assumption. That was the that was the point I did not understand. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, because it's, it's a very strong assumption. Yeah. Yeah, we try to circumvent this difficulty. That's yeah, no, no, no. I, I was just that, that it was like, where, where does that ra rabbit come out of the hat? How, how'd you? How, now I understand it was, it was just assumed. Um, uh, the other thing is a really minor comment. It's just about uh, the exposition, because you probably will use the same notes for other talks. When you, when, when you are are talking about the, uh, the, the four manifold case and and your results with, uh, with Matt and and Alice. Um, the put the quotient in the wrong place. So uh, you know, ac actually S4 doesn't have any orientable quotients. On the other hand, the, the torus has you know, 50 odd quotients, right? So you have <laughs> lots of flat manifolds that are different from the, the torus. I mean, it's flat, right. it doesn't tell you it's a torus. It it's just tells you it's finitely covered by a torus. That's right, thank you. Thank that's you. just, a, that's th those are peanut shells from the peanut gallery. <laughs> All right. Okay, any other questions? Okay, then let's uh, let's thank Paul for his lecture. So welcome back. Our next speaker is Yi Lei from Stanford University.
and she will speak on uh, O2 symmetry of 3D steady gradient Ricci solitons. Thanks a lot for the invitation and the introduction. I'm very happy to speak at here and uh, very sorry not to be able to come in person because my visa problem. I uh, hope I will have the chance to visit Italy in the near future. So today I will talk about the symmetry of 3D static gradient Ricci solitons. And so let's first begin with the Ricci flow. Um, so the Ricci flow is a geometric equation introduced by Hamilton in 1982. And it's a family of smooth matrix satisfying the following equations. So the Ricci, uh, to the, to the derivative of, of, of the matrix is equal to negative two times the Ricci curvature. And the following picture shows how the Ricci flow does on constant curvature matrix. So if you have a round sphere with constant curvature equal to one, and then the Ricci flow will shrink the matrix to a round point. So this will get extinct in a finite time. And then if you have a flat torus, then the right-hand side of this equation is zero. So the Ricci flow will keep invariant this flat matrix. And if you have a hyperbolic surface with constant curvature negative one, then the Ricci flow will expand this matrix, like this picture. And so this, these three pictures are also uh, the pictures for Ricci flows on Einstein manifolds. The Einstein manifolds are uh, the Riemannian matrix satisfying that the Ricci equals to a multiple of the matrix tensor. And depending on if the Einstein constant, this multiple is positive, zero, or negative, now um, this Ricci flow will shrinks, keeps invariant, or expands this uh, matrix. And so these Einstein manifolds can be generalized to another concept, which is called the Ricci soliton. So um, the Ricci soliton is a Riemannian manifold satisfying the following equation. So Ricci minus one half of the, uh, sorry, the, the, the screen is not moving. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, it satisfies the following soliton equations. So Ricci minus one half of the lead derivative is equal to a multiple of the matrix. And so um, here that uh, this is uh, the additional term comparing to the Einstein matrix. And so in particular, if the vector field X is a gradient of some smooth function F, then I'm going to call this uh, um, soliton to be gradient which is soliton and in this case the lead derivative of the gradient of is equal to two times the hessian so this additional term becomes to the hessian of f and so this is the um, gradient which is soliton equation and based on the intuition from last slide this soliton is gonna uh, called is gonna to be called shrinking steady or expanding depending on if this lambda is positive uh, equal to zero or negative. Okay, and uh, today we're going to focus on the second case of the steady gradient Ricci soliton. And so uh, the steady gradient Ricci soliton has the following equation, um, Ricci equals to the Hessian square of F. Okay, so um, as we said that the soliton would generate self-similar Ricci flows and the, in particular, the steady gradient soliton will solve, uh, will generate isometric Ricci flows. So the time slices of the, this Ricci flow is, iso, is isometric to each other, which is back to different times. And in particular, this Ricci flow can be written out explicitly in the following way. So um, we can compute directly that the GT, which is the pullback of the soliton matrix under this diffeomorphism generated by gradient of F, and this GT satisfies the Ricci flow equations. And so we'll say that this is the Ricci flow associated to the steady gradient Ricci soliton. And uh, in particular, this Ricci flow is defined for all times. So that's an eternal Ricci flow that we're talking about. Okay, so um, next let's look at some classical examples of steady gradient Ricci solitons. And first example is uh, the cigar soliton which is also the first examples of all the solitons. Um, this is constructed by Hamilton on R2. 
So this is a rotationist metric, metric and uh, this is the potential function. So we can check directly that this satisfies the uh, the, the, the steady solid and equation. Okay, so on the following picture is the a picture of the cigar soliton. So this is the critical is a critical point of the potential function, which is also the rotational center. And uh, um, so you see that this cigar looks like a flat cylinder at infinity. And more precisely, what this means is that if you take a sequence of points going to infinity, say pi, uh, pi plus one going to infinity, and then you consider the pointed manifold mg pointed at pi, and then you can take a smooth limit of this sequence of manifolds, and this converges to r cross s1, so this flat cylinder. Okay, um, and uh, so if you fix the base point, but this time you take a number, a sequence of numbers, lambda i goes to infinity, and then look at this rescaled manifold, m lambda i inverse. So you scale down this metric by this lambda i, the sequence, and point it at a fixed base point. So you can choose the rotational center, and then this sequence of manifolds converges to a half line. Okay, because um, so as you take this lambda larger and larger, and this uh, uh, this cigar gets thinner and thinner, and uh, this convergence is true in the form of our substance. Okay, so um, so we're going to call this uh, um, the first limit to be the asymptotic limit of this cigar soliton, uh, and the second limit to be the asymptotic. Okay, so um, that's the um, cigar soliton, and uh, um, that we said that the cigar soliton generate a self-similar Ricci flow with isometric time slices, and uh, so uh, now let me draw a picture of the Ricci flow. Okay, so. Um, so the reason that I, uh, so this is uh, the last, uh, the, say, for example, at time t equals to negative one, and this second cigar is t equals to zero, and the next one is t equals to one. So the reason that I draw this picture in this staircase, a staircase model is that, um, okay, so if you choose a base point, choose a some point, x starting from t equals to zero, negative one, then in the next second, this point will come closer to the tip P. And in the next second, this point X will come even closer to the base point P. So this is uh, uh, caused by the curvature being positive and the uh, Ricci flow distance shrinking under this curvature condition. And so uh, this is uh, the tip contracting of the cigar soliton. Okay, uh, and then the higher dimensional generalization of the cigar soliton is uh, constructed by Brian, and that's called the Brian soliton. And uh, um, this soliton are constructed on Rn, and they are also rotationally symmetric and has positive curvature operators. So the following picture shows what uh, a Brian soliton looks like. And so um, the difference from the Brian soliton with the cigar soliton in the last slide is that um, this time if we want to consider the two limits as before, then we have to do uh, some different things. So if you choose a, a, a sequence of points going to infinity, and uh, if you don't rescale the metric, then the pointed manifolds will only converge to the Euclidean space at this, uh, uh, because this diameter of the metric ball at distance r increases like the square root of r. Okay, so um, to guarantee that we get a non-trivial limit, we should scale it down by the scalar curvature at these points. So we consider this m r p i g 
dot pi. Okay, and then we can show that this converges to the cylinder r cos s2 r in the smooth way. And uh, this is the asymptotic limit as before. And uh, uh, also, if you take a sequence of numbers going to infinity and fix the base point, we uh, scale down the metric and fix the base point. And then this converges to also a half line. Okay, in the goal of half of sense. So this is the uh, asymptotic cone. And, uh, um, and you can also show that the scalar curvature of this Born soliton decays linearly using this diameter bound. Okay, so um, that's the Born soliton also generates a self similar Ricci flow, which um, looks like the cigars, which looks like the uh, picture in the last slide. Okay. So um, now let's look at um, the steady gradient solitons in dimension three generated by these two examples. So for the first example that can uh, we can see from um, the previous slide is the product of R cross cigar and uh, the 3D Brian soliton. Okay, so this, uh, these two are steady gradient solitons in dimension three. And under additional um, curvature or volume assumptions, we can deduce that uh, the soliton is either the first one or the second one. So let me uh, state some of these uniqueness results in the following. So first, let's look at the, this uh, uniqueness results for the 3D Brown soliton. So if you assume that uh, this soliton is non-collapsed, then it must be the Brown soliton. So this is by Brondo. Um, and then if you assume that um, the curvature decays linearly, then you can also show that uh, the brine, uh, it must be the brown soliton. And uh, um, and then for the R cross cigar on the other on the other end, R cross cigar, you um, will have the following uniqueness results. If you assume that the curvature decays faster than linearly, then it must be a quotient for R cross cigar which is basically the S1 cross cigar with the S1 having arbitrary diameters. And then um, we can also assume this integral condition on the scalar curvature. So assume that the scalar curvature integrated on the R ball centered at a fixed point divided by R goes to zero as R goes to infinity. Uh, so you can see that this condition is certainly true on S1 cross cigar. Okay, and then this result says that the converse is also true. So if you assume this condition, then it must be S1 cross cigar. Okay, so you see that under this uh, various additional conditions, one can deduce that the a 3D static gradient energy soliton is either the R cross cigar or the 3D brown soliton. And it is natural to wonder if there are some other um, static gradient solitons that does not satisfy all these previous assumptions. And this is um, a, a conjecture, a previous conjecture by Hamilton. And so um, it says that there exists a 3D static uh, exists a 3D flying wing, which is a 3D static gradient soliton that is asymptotic to a sector with angle between zero and pi. So you can see that uh, uh, this type of Steady static gradient solitons can be considered as intermediate examples of the, the first two, uh, R cross cigar and the Brown soliton, because the Brown soliton is, uh, uh, is asymptotic to a sector with theta equal to zero, and R cross cigar is asymptotic to a half plane, which is a sector with angle theta equal to pi. So that's a, the two borderline cases. Okay, and then uh, we confirm this conjecture. Um, slightly earlier. And so we um, find a flying wing that is also Z2 cross O2 symmetric. So what does this symmetry mean is the following. So here is a Z2 isometry which reflects this, uh, uh, which is a reflection in this direction. And then um, the O2 symmetry means 
that away from a complete geodesic, the metric can be written down as a warped product metric. So this is what we mean by Z2 cross O2 symmetry. And uh, um, so um, for this to define wing, we also we can also show that uh, uh, if you choose a sequence of points going to infinity, so say P, P, I, P, I plus one, P, I goes to infinity, then we can show that this uh, um, point in manifold M, G, P, I converges to, so there are two possibilities of either R cross R, which happens if the, you choose a sequence of points near the edges, which is this complete geodesic, or uh, it converges to R2 cross S1, which happens if you choose these points to go away from these edges. Okay, and um, uh, so these are the two asymptotic limits. And, uh, uh, and also that um, the, if you choose a lambda i goes to infinity, then the blowdown limit converges in the form of Hausdorff sense to the sector with angle theta like this. That's a non-zero angle. Okay, so that's how a flying wing looks like. Um, and so now let's put these solutions, put these solitons in one diagram and uh, compare their asymptotic cones. Okay, so as we said before, that this R cross cigar is uh, asymptotic to a half plane, and the flying wing is asymptotic to a sector, and the Brian soliton is asymptotic to a ray. And so this corresponds to theta equals to pi, and last one corresponds to uh, theta equals to zero. Okay, um, so this can be compared with, uh, uh, so this this chart can be compared with the solutions in mean curvature flow where, where these uh, uh, solutions are the convex translators in R3. Okay, so we're going to compare this to this static gradient solitons with the convex translators in R3 and compare the asymptotic cones with the graphical domains of these translators. Okay, so this uh, R cross cigar is compared to the R cross Grim Reaper. So the Grim Reaper is a one-dimensional solution to the curve shortening flow, which is, uh, which, uh, so this is how it looks like. And, uh, um, and the flying wings are also a notion used in mean curvature flow in the that's, uh, translators, which looks like this. A two-dimensional surface looks like this. And uh, uh, the ball soliton is the rotation is symmetric. So it also, so it's the analog of the Brian soliton in Ricci flow, but it's two-dimensional and it opens up like a paraboloid here. Okay, and so um, these are the graphical domains of the convex translators. And uh, um, if you consider the asymptotic cones of the convex translators, and then this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so um, now we know that these convex translators in R3 are completely classified by the following diagram. And so, uh, we wonder if we can classify the 3D static gradient which is solitons by this uh, by this first chart. And the first question to do this is to see if um, the last row is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So we know that if you have a brown soliton, then it is asymptotic to a ray. And conversely, we want to ask if um, the asymptotic cone is uh, is a ray then can we say that it must be the Brian soliton? And uh, um, this is uh, and this is the analog of the following main curvature flow result by Wang Xujia. So where he showed that the convex entire translator in R3 must be the ball soliton. So that's that means that the last the last row in the second chart here 
as a one-to-one -one correspondence to each other. Okay, so now um, we can show that this analog in which flow is also true. And so we show that the, um, if a static gradient tree soliton is asymptotically to Ray, then it must be the Brian soliton. So assuming it has positive curvature. Okay, right. so this is first result. Um, and so next we want to look at the symmetries of 3D static gradient which is solitons. And so first why, we, uh, why the symmetry is important to study and uh, in classifying these solutions. And uh, uh, so this can be seen by the following results. So first, um, by the construction of the Brown soliton, um, we know that if you assume the soliton is O3 symmetric, and then the Ricci soliton equation will just become a system of ODE, and you can solve that ODE system and show the solution is unique. And so that's the construction of the Brown soliton. Um, and so another another result in the other direction is that if you have a two commuting healing vector fields, then the soliton must be the other one, must be R cross cigar. So the assumption of two commuting healing vector fields uh, can be considered as the infinitesimal isometry assumption. And so this uh, leads to the uh, R cross cigar. And so it's natural to ask if there is a uniform symmetry satisfied by all the static gradients which is soliton in dimension three, and in particular satisfied by all the uh, 3D flying wings. And so to get an, an, a good candidate for this symmetry, let's look at this following chart again. And this time we um, look at their symmetries of these solutions. And so I would say that the R cross cigar is Z2 cross O2 symmetric. So um, that's, um, that means the following. So this, uh, this uh, here's the R cross cigar. So here's a Z2 reflection, which fixes a hypersurface of a cigar, of a cigar soliton. And then the Z2 symmetry means that away from the line of tips of cigar, then the symmetry, and then um, the, sol the metric is a warped product with its one fibers. Okay, and then um, the Brown soliton is of course O3 symmetric, but you can also say that this implies um, Z2 cross O2 symmetric. Okay, because, so let me draw a picture to, to um, explain. So this is a Brown soliton and uh, it's like a parabolid, and so um, the reflection is easy to see and uh, uh, you can choose a complete geodesic and then away from this geodesic you can also write down the metric as a warped product with its one fibers okay so um now this brown soliton is also z2 cross o2 symmetric and uh, uh, because when we see that that uh, the examples we constructed for the flying wing are also Z2 cross O2 symmetric. So ideally, we would like to show that all the flying wings are Z2 cross O2 symmetric. Okay, so that is the, um, that is the uh, candidate for the symmetry we want to prove. And the, 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 this can also be um, this another uh, another evidence uh, for this is uh, if you compare the O2 symmetry in Ricci flow with the Z2 symmetry in Minkovitri flow, and then um, this is the symmetry for the convex translators, and so this is the symmetry for the Minkovitri flow flying wings, and so. Um, the an analog of this symmetry is a Z2 cross O2 symmetry in the Ricci flow flying wings. Okay, so now um, um, let me state the, the, our next result. So we now can show that all the 3D flying wings are O2 symmetric. So uh, more explicitly, this means that uh, away from a complete geodesic, the metric is a warped product metric with a swarm fibers. Okay, so can, um, and um, 
So this uh, symmetry heads for all CD flying wings. And uh, combining this theorem with our previous theorem A, and then we can deduce immediately that all the 3D static gradient, which is solitons, are O2 symmetric. Because theorem A says that uh, if it is not a flying wing, then it must be the brine soliton. But we know that brine soliton is O2 symmetric. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so um, uh, in the next part of this talk, we're going to uh, sketch the proof of the O2 symmetry theorem, which is theorem B, and the uh, uh, and uh, we'll also obtain the proof of theorem, sketch the proof of theorem A in between. So first, let's look at the following general scheme of proving the O2 symmetry theorem. And uh, it can be divided into the following uh, steps. So these steps are often, uh, are also, uh, can also be seen in the, uh, in, in the proofs of proving uh, G symmetry, where G is some Lie group for some Ricci flows or ancient Ricci flow solutions or steady solitons. Um, but today we'll only focus on this uh, um, O2 symmetry for the steady, for the, for the flying wings. Okay, so um, the first step we want to do is, uh, is asymptotic geometry analysis. So this means that um, we want to show that away from a compact subset in this soliton, the geometry can uh, locally be described by two geometric models. So it is the first one, the first model is R cos cigar, and the other one is R T cos this one. So basically this is what we're seeing in the um, flying wing examples we constructed previously. And we'll show that this is in general true for any flying wings. Okay, so that's the asymptotic geometry uh, at infinity. And why this is uh, useful for the O2 symmetry theorem, because these two geometric models are both O2 symmetric. So um, they're O2 symmetric. So now you can clue up this local um, approximate matrix and get a global approximate matrix outside of this compact subset. Okay, and so, uh, and moreover, you can upgrade this approximate metric to a more precise approximate metric satisfying some arrow estimate. And then you consider the killing field to this approximate metric. And uh, you, you know, and well, then we can evolve this approximate killing field by some parabolic equation under the Ricci flow and uh, get that this. Um, and evolve this into a exact killing field. Okay, and then using this exact killing field, this will generate the O2 isometry that we want. So that's the um, major steps that we're going to follow. And so now let's um, look at each step more closely. So first we, uh, let's see the asymptotic geometry analysis. Okay, so uh, first, so from now, from now on, we're going to assume that the Mg is a 3D steady gradient which is soliton, and uh, it is uh, not a brine soliton. And so this, uh, um, this assumption will be assumed throughout this talk. Okay, and under this assumption, we can show that uh, um, the following lemma is true. So um, we can, so what this lemma says is that uh, um, can be described by the following pictures. So, so this is, so imagine this is your solid Mg. Okay, and then um, if you take a sequence of points going to infinity, so first, uh, sorry, so there's a smooth curve gamma, which is this blue line here. And if you choose the points going to infinity along this, um, along this curve gamma, and then this converges to, and then this uh, uh, this rescued manifold converges smoothly to the first geometry model R cos cigar. So this this R x i. So this is the volume scale. Um, so that the 
limit will not be a Euclidean space. And so this volume scale is, uh, um, is uh, basically the radius of the half Euclidean volume of the same radius. Okay, so um, if you rescale by this, by this number here, which could potentially get very large at a spatial infinity, and then you will either see the first, the first limit or the second one. And depending on if these points are going um, on gamma, we're going away from gamma. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, two two possible asymptotic limits, and then okay, so now uh, let's look at the asymptotic cones of this of this soliton. So here we're assuming that uh, it is not a brown soliton, and uh, so we're trying to show that uh, it is asymptotic to a sector with a non-zero angle, and so this will prove theorem A. Okay, so um. In the following, um, what we'll do this? Uh, uh, what we'll do an argument like this? So let me draw a picture. So this is the bar, uh, so this is a solid in MG, and uh, um, we're going to choose a point X. So imagine that X is chosen far away from the uh, from the curve gamma, from the edge gamma. And so the geometry around X is uh, modeled on R T cross S one, the flat cylindrical, uh, the flat cylindrical plane or the bubble sheet plane. Okay, so this is X, and then we're going to follow X backwards in the Ricci flow, and so uh, equivalently, this amounts to moving X by the integral curve of phi T uh, of gradient of F. Let's so see phi T X. So remember that uh, phi t is the diffeomorphism generates the, the switchy flow of the of the soliton. Okay, so now and then we consider the following two quantities. And so one is the um, capital H T, which is the distance from this point to gamma, and also uh, little h t. So little h t is the volume scale at this point. At this point here, and so um, it's not hard to show that this uh, this point phi t x is also modeled on the flat cylindrical plane, and roughly this uh, this little h t here is the length of the s one fibers. So it is comparable to the length of this one fibers in this cylindrical plane. Okay, and then um, if we look at the distance distortions to these two distance to, to these two lens functions, uh, then we can show that uh, this two function satisfies the following ODE system, uh, or inequality system. And so um, if you look at this ODE system, then you can deduce from this that uh, the first function increases at least linearly as t goes to positive infinity, and the second function stays bounded at as t goes to infinity, and so um, what we will deduce from these um, uh, observations uh, from these two inequalities is that uh, so we claim that the first inequality implies theorem A. So first it implies that theta is bigger than zero, and uh, so this implies theorem A. So why this is asymptotic cone has a non-zero angle? So that's because, um, so intuitively, so let me draw a picture of some, in, instead of explaining it rigorously. So um, let's let's fix a point P, see the critical point, and connect this point P with uh, with this phi t x, and also connect this P with a point that is closest to phi t x on gamma and uh, connect these two points together. And then in this comparison triangle, this comparison triangle here, this, this, this red triangle here, and uh, um, this angle here can, can show that this is not a zero angle because uh, the lenses the, the lenses of three sides also, uh, are all increases linearly. Okay, um, so this implies that the theta is not zero, and this comparison triangle will um, 
will be passed down to the GOMO power source limit and uh, it also becomes a non-degenerated triangle. Okay, and, uh, and then let's come back to the second inequality. So the little ht is stay expanded at infinity. And then we can deduce from this that the uh, scalar curvature has a positive limit at infinity. So the scalar curvature does not decay to zero. And so this thing, so this can be seen by the um, by the following intuition. So here you have a, you see that this uh, length of the S1 fibers here does not uh, go to infinity. And so um, if you can consider this as the S1 fiber in a cigar soliton whose tip is at, uh, at gamma. And so now this uh, will give a lower bound on the scalar curvature at this tip. And so uh, if you let these points go to infinity, then uh, the scalar curvature is is always like it's always bounded away from zero and uh, um similarly you can show that if you uh it is the same thing on the other end of gamma the so scalar curvature will also have um a non-zero limit on the other end when ace goes to negative infinity okay so that's what we can um, deduce immediately from this um ODE system, and uh, and then pr more previous, uh, more precisely, we can even show that this two positive limit of the scalar curvature at the two ends of gamma are equal to each other. Okay, so um, and uh, moreover, um, this equalness of the scalar curvature at the two ends of gamma is a part of the so-called Z two symmetry at infinity. And so we can show now that uh, um, in order to get these two asymptotic limits, uh, one is the R cos cigar and the other is R2 cos is one, we don't have to do any rescalings anymore. So we can remove this rescaling by the volume scale. And then um, we can say directly that this, um, as long as you choose the points going to infinity, then the sequence of manifolds will converge to one of the asymptotic limits. Okay. Uh, so, so here uh, from now on, we're going to assume that uh, uh, because these two limits are equal, so we can uh, rescale the metric, rescale MG so that uh, um, these two limits are both equal to four. And under this assumption, this normalization condition, we can uh, we can obtain a curvature estimate on these solitons, and it is the following. Uh, so this is, this is a two-sided bound on the curvature. So first, uh, we can show that the scalar curvature decay uh, is bounded below by this exponential uh, function in the distance to gamma, and uh, uh, it is bounded by this polynomial function in the distance to gamma. And so um, for the lower bound of the scalar curvature, it is almost a sharp in the following way. So they can take this epsilon to be arbitrarily small um, at the cost that they say epsilon could be arbitrarily large. And so why this is almost a sharp? Because if you look at the cigar soliton, So if you rescue so that the cigar soliton, um, the scalar curvature of the cigar soliton at the tip is equal to four. And then you can compute it directly that is the scalar curvature decays like e to the negative two r, where the r is the distance to the critical point. Okay, so now this is, uh, um, so now this is the um, now this lower bound is uh, is similar to this uh, precise decay of the scalar curvature in cigar. Okay, and uh, um, so for the upper bound, this is uh, in particular interesting when k is greater than equal to two, because when k is equal to one, this is only a linear curvature decay, and it does not distinguish this soliton from the Brown soliton, and in fact. This uh, um, this 
upper bound holds for any k as proven by an inductive process. So one can first show that this is true for k equals to 2, which is the smallest integer to, uh, to make this inequality interesting. And then use induction, you can show that if uh, this is true for k, then it implies this is true for k plus 1. OK, so um, for the upper bound, we, um, this may not be an optimal upper bound, but this is good for a purpose to proving the O2 symmetry theorem. OK, um, so now let's go back to the roadmap of the uh, O2 symmetry theorem and see what we have achieved so far. So uh, we've done with the asymptotic geometry analysis. And then we want to construct a approximate O2 symmetric metric satisfying some good arrow estimate. And we'll and explain what this arrow estimate that we want to achieve. OK, so first, um, using the asymptotic geometry analysis, we can glue up the local geometries and uh, obtain a approximate metric, which satisfies the um, first arrow estimate. So that uh, so this metric satisfies that uh, it is uh, this much close to the solid metric. So G is a solid metric, and then we can use some symmetry improvement theorem. Sorry. So the symmetry improvement theorem basically says that. Uh, um, so it basically says the following. So. Um, if the soliton looks like um, R2 causes 1 in a large neighborhood at X, so X is some point in M, and then, um, so epsilon close in this large ball will imply that uh, um, say, um, 1 over 100 epsilon close at the center of this ball. And so this is, a, um, so this is a, the reason why we call the symmetry improvement theorem. And uh, um, this, this is the symmetry improvement theorem, um, which is in the static gradient soliton, but this can also be stated in the, um, in the Ricci flow of the soliton, which is uh, the following. So if you look at a parabolic neighborhood centered at a point, and then if you know that uh, um, in this backward parabolic neighborhood, you have that if epsilon close needs to R2 causes 1, and then this will imply that uh, um, it is a 1 over 100 epsilon close at x. OK, so uh, that's the um, symmetry improvement theorem. And uh, um, in the following, we're going to show how to uh, use this to achieve the second arrow estimate for this uh, approximate uh, metric. So here we want to achieve an exponential decay in the distance to gamma. And so here's what we do. So imagine this is your soliton mg. And so um, first, we apply the symmetry improvement theorems on the points which are 100 away from, so see, or 100 away from gamma. So this, these points are in this region here. And the, um, now, because this is an uh, epsilon close, and this is uh, c um, at distance d to gamma, and then in this uh, and in this shadowed region here, the symmetry will get improved. The closeness to R two causes one will get improved to say one hundred times epsilon. Okay, and then um, at an even more interior region, a region even more further away from 
Auto gamma, see this double shaded region here. And it will, uh, you can show that this becomes to 100, 1 over 100 score times epsilon. Okay, and so you can see now the, the pattern is that as you go further and further away from gamma, the decay, um, the arrow to the soliton matrix will get smaller and smaller. And so there's a, um, so there's a, in particular, you can find a, a positive number delta such that this arrow is bounded by this exponential function in the distance to gamma. Okay, so um, here this uh, delta is some uh, constant greater than zero, and this is an arrow estimate that we can achieve by this, uh, by this uh, inductive argument. And then what we actually want to achieve is, uh, is a more precise arrow estimate. And so now recall that we're assuming that uh, um, this normalization condition is true. So the scalar curvature has positive limit equal to four at the two ends. And so uh, we can upgrade the symmetry improvement theorems to a more precise version. So you see that in the last slide, when applying the symmetry improvement theorem, we need to sacrifice some distance to gamma. But if you take into account the tip contracting of the cigar, then you don't need to sacrifice this much distance. So um, what, I, what do I mean is that uh, eventually with a more precise symmetry improvement theorem, we can construct a approximate metric satisfying this, as, this arrow estimate. And so um, this is an exponential function. And in particular, um, corresponds to this four here, we can show that this exponent here is can be slightly slightly larger than two. Okay. So um, now we um, we find out the uh, approximate metric that satisfies this uh, arrow estimate, and then next uh, we want to look at the killing field of this approximate metric and we will show that uh, we can evolve this killing field this approximate killing field to an exact killing field of the solid metric so and the, the evolution is done by the following parabolic equation okay so um the this is the equation we're going to use to evolve this factor field x and then um, this, this is uh, initial condition is the approximate killing field uh, and then one can show directly that if the a vector field evolved by this equation then its lead derivative evolves by the following uh, parabolic equation so that's uh, uh, so that's the, uh, the lead derivative or evolved by the linearized Ricci de Turk flow as the following. Um, so this is a little narrow with Laplacian with respect to the switchy flow. Okay, so um, for the lead derivative, if you take the absolute value, the norm of this lead derivative, then by the Anderson Chow estimate, one can show that this um, norm satisfies the following is a subsolution to the following parabolic PD, linear parabolic PDE. So um, this is one observation we can see. And uh, um, so now we're going to combine the ingredients that we gathered in the previous slides. So first, we have a approximate metric satisfying this arrow estimate. And then we have a curvature lower bound, which is, uh, uh, which, which is this much small. And so um, the constant here is chosen such that, so epsilon two is a slightly, uh, is smaller than epsilon one, okay? And you choose epsilon one first, and then you choose epsilon two, so that epsilon two is smaller than that. And then, okay, and then this tells you that this um, g minus g bar is, uh, um, is um, is uh, smaller than the scalar curvature and uh, uh, you also we, we know that uh, 
because uh, h so h zero is the lead derivative of x zero um the 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 solid metric with respect So here are some future questions. If you um, so first, let's recall some previous theorems. And if you assume the non-collapsing condition, and then you can show that the static gradient soliton is uh, is rotationally symmetric, and then um, and then using this rotational symmetry of the static gradient soliton, you can show that the ancient Ricci flow on R three and on S three are also ro uh, rotationally symmetric. And if you consider the static gradient soliton as the a parabolic version of the symmetry problem, uh, elliptic version of the this symmetry problem, then you can consider the Ricci flow as the parabolic version of the symmetry. And so now, as we show that all the um, non-collapsed and collapsed solution uh, solitons are O2 symmetric, and then we want to ask if uh, the symmetries holds in the parabolic case, which is the 3D ancient Ricci flow, so R3 and S3. So, uh, could that also be O2 symmetric? And another question is to see if we can now classify all the 3D static gradient solitons with this using this O2 symmetry. And now the question has been reduced to the following. So for any angle theta, can we find a unique flying wing asymptotic to this particular angle? And so um, this is unknown so far. And the last uh, question is um, consider we have constructed many other static gradient solitons with positive curvature operator. Uh, one is the first class O M minus two cross O two symmetric, which is a higher dimensional flying wings, and also the Z two cross O M minus one symmetric static gradient solitons. And these two classes are both positively curved and uh, satisfy the O two symmetry. And so now. Um, we can ask whether all these n-dimensional static gradient solitons with positive curvature operator satisfy this O2 symmetry. And uh, uh, if so, maybe we can get a classification of these solitons. Okay, so that's it, all I want to say. And uh, thanks very much for your uh, attention and uh, uh, the patience with this uh, internet connection trouble. Thanks. Thank you for your patience. So let me ask, uh, see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, hi. Um, hi. So you mentioned the uniqueness uh, question of, uh, of the solitons with, uh, with theta, right? With the theta yeah. angle. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering whether um, the flying wing is possibly known to be unique if either theta is a uh, very small or close to pi? Um, not, not yet. So uh, for right now, for any angle theta, it is not known if the it is unique. And in fact, it is not uh, ever known that uh, if for any angle theta, we can find a flying wing asymptotic to it. So. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah, yeah. So we only find a, a family of these flying wings correspond to some angles. Uh, oh, some angles. Ah, ah, okay, okay. Some angles. Yeah, but we do not know if this uh, covers all the values between zero and pi. Okay, thank you. But I believe this uh, as it could be uh, proved mm -hmm. by some other methods. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? So um, you, you mentioned you, there are constructions in higher dimensions as well. The, 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 um, one of the last when you sort of going through the. Yes. With positive curvature operator. Okay. So earlier in your talk, when you mentioned positive curvature, did you mean positive curvature operator or? Oh, that... yes. yes. Okay. In, okay. in three dimension, this, uh, this two concepts are the uh, equivalent, but in okay. higher dimension. Yeah, I do need to assume a positive curvature operator. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, then uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you again, Yi. Thanks. Uh,
I'm very sorry for this. Uh, oh, it's <laughs> Okay, so for our final lecture today, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Jeff Fiaklovsky from uh, UC Irvine, who's going to speak on gravitational instantons, rational surfaces, and K3 surfaces. Okay, um, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. I'm very sorry I wasn't able to make it in person this time, but um, hopefully next time, Everything will be better. So let me get started. So I'm praying that my internet does not fail. So it's been pretty stable this morning. So let's get started. So I'm gonna talk about gravitational instantons. So we begin with the definition. So I'm looking at a real four manifold with a Ramanian metric G. So I'm gonna call it a gravita gravitational instanton. If it's complete, the holonomy is contained in SU2 and it has finite L2 norm of curvature. Okay, so let me explain each of these uh, assumptions in a bit more detail. So this uh, condition of the holonomy contained in SU2 is called the Calabi-Yau condition. And this happens if and only if. Um, there's a complex structure and the metric is scalar with respect to that complex structure. And also the canonical bundle is trivial. Okay, so that's well-known Calabi-Yau condition. But there's a coincidence in, uh, in uh, one of these exceptional Lie group isomorphisms, SU2 is equal to SP1. So these metrics are also a hyperkähler. So there's not just one complex structure, there are three complex structures, I, J, and K, which satisfy the quaternion relations. And the metric is Kähler with respect to a two spheres worth of complex structure. Take any combination like this, AI plus BJ plus CK, where the those coefficients are in the in S2. Okay, so next I want to tell you about the, the curvature of these types of metrics. <clears throat> so the Calabi out condition um, implies that there exists a parallel holomorphic two zero form. And so this is holomorphic with respect to the complex structure I. And that holomorphic two zero form capital omega can be written as omega j plus square root of minus one omega k, where those are the Kähler forms with respect to those other two complex structures. Okay, so this form is parallel. And the bundle of self-dual two forms um, decomposes into multiples of the Kähler form, real multiples of the i Kähler form, plus a rank two bundle, which is the lambda two zero plus lambda zero two real part of that bundle. So this has a basis of parallel sections, so the bundle lambda two plus is flat. Well, the curvature of lambda two plus is given by the following. It has a block decomposition. The um, upper left block is, or just the left, there's only two blocks. The left block is the self-dual part of the vial curvature plus scalar over 12 times the identity. And the right block is, this is just a traceless Ricci in dimension four, Ricci minus scalar over four times the metric. So if this vanishes, just taking a trace, we see scalar curvature has to vanish from this term and then Ricci must vanish from this term and bio plus has to vanish. So really this is sort of the local, um, the local hyperkähler condition, uh, Ricci flat and anti-self dual. But we're just, our assumption is really a global assumption as we have an assumption on the holonomy. So this is just the local version of it. Okay, so what? Um, so I just said that the manifold is complete, the metric is complete. Well, if it happens to be compact by the Enriquez Kodair classification, so a, a compact hyperkähler um, four manifold has to either be a K3 surface or a torus. So in the first part of this talk, we're, we're only going to be interested in complete non compact examples. So we'll come back to the compact case for the the last part of the talk when we uh, when I'll talk about the relation to K3 surfaces. So let's talk about the non-compact case. So what we'll do is we'll fix some model hyperkähler end. So just just an end. So it's just a, a four manifold end of some four manifold with a metric and with these uh, three complex structures. 
And then associated to these, we have the three Kähler forms, omega i, omega j, and omega k. So now, and now I'll take a complete um, uh, metric, xg, with three complex structures, i, j, k, and we want to require that this be asymptotic to our model. So outside of a compact set, we want the metric to be asymptotic to the model metric plus some strictly decaying terms. So here, R is the distance to some base point, and this is what some strictly um, inverse polynomial decay. So the metric is the model plus O of R to the minus delta. And then all three Kähler forms are asymptotic to the model. So omega I is omega I of the model plus decay, same for omega J, same for omega K. So that's our that's our assumptions. So not just the metric, but all three complex structures also um, are sort of asymptotic to the model. Okay, so now let me give you a list of the known types of geometries. So just this will be a survey of, of uh, a lot of the known examples. So the first case is called ALE. So the model end in this case is just Euclidean space. So C2 mod gamma, where gamma is a finite subgroup of SU2 acting freely on the three sphere. And we just have the Euclidean metric and then just the constant um, um, IJK matrices. So I don't write those down explicitly here. So uh, if this is a cone, so any metric which is asymptotic to this, so there's no assumption in, in, in a compact region, but just outside of a compact set, it, it is asymptotic to this cone. So this is roughly what they look like. So these, this class of instantons is characterized by their volume growth being maximal. So we're in four dimensions. So volume of a ball of radius R around the point is asymptotic to some constant times R to the fourth. And the tangent cone and infinity of these is, of course, the just C2 mod gamma, just that black cone. So a famous example of this is the Gucci henson metric, which lives on the cotangent bundle of S2. There's the um, uh, Gibbons-Hawking metrics of type AK, where um, we have a cyclic group at infinity. And then there are these uh, other examples found by Kronheimer of type DK, E6, E7, and E8. And the groups at infinity are the binary dihedral, um, binary tetrahedral, binary octahedral, and binary dodecahedral groups. So um, those were constructed by Kronheimer using this hyperkähler quotient construction. So he also um, used twister theory to classify these. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so that's... Um, the ALE case. Next case is called ALF. So the model space in this case, so I'm not gonna write down all the complex structures. I'm just gonna concentrate on the metrics for the next few examples. So the, the metric looks like the following. So, um, so here pi is gonna be a circle bundle over S2. So that's uh, some three manifold, which is gonna be a lens space. And then theta is a, certain, is a connection form on that circle bundle. So then what the leading terms of the metric look like dr squared plus r squared times the pullback of the spherical metric on S2 plus the connection form squared. So um, notice if I had put an r squared here so that the circle direction grows just like the S2 directions, then we'd be in the previous case. So the con contrast with the ALE case, the the length of the circle goes to a constant in infinity, but the S2 directions grow like they would in Euclidean space. So it becomes sort of a squashed Berger sphere in infinity. Um, so we this model also admits a Z2 quotient. And that, um, in effect, we can replace S2 with RP2 and take a non-orientable circle bundle over that. And then it, that would give us an orientable three manifold. So um, these types of instantons are characterized by uh, having cubic volume growth. Volume is proportional to R cubed. And the tangent at cone of infinity will be R3 in the S2 case, uh, or R3 mod plus minus one in the R RP2 case. So examples of these are the um, famous example, the Taub nut metric, which um, LeBrun showed lives on C2. 
Uh, there's the ALF-AK, which are called multi talb nut, and then ALF-DK, which are um, were found by Atia Hitchin and Cherkis Hitchin and Kapustin. So I'm not going to give details about that. Just wanted to mention, uh, give credit here. Um, so let me move on to the next case. Uh, for the next case, I need to explain a little bit of complex geometry. So this. Uh, the next case is going to be a ALG, and this is related to elliptic vibrations. So an elliptic surface is just a, um, a complex surface X with a holomorphic projection to a uh, Riemann surface C, and the generic fiber has genus 1. So here's sort of the, the picture. So the generic fibers are in black, but there can be some degeneration of the fibers. Here I've uh, attempted to draw a degeneration to a nodal cubic so uh, Kadaira and uh, Neron classified the possible singular fibers. So there, there are um, um, two main cases. So there's a case of called infinite monodromy. And those were in Kadaira's notation. Those are the IB and IB star. And then there are these um, finite monodromy cases. So I, I zero star, Roman numeral two, three, four, and their dual types, two star, three star, four star. So I, I'm not going to write down the, I could give you a big table with all the monodromy matrices, but I mean, that would just let me just attempt to explain. This is related to the ADE singularities before. So what these singular fibers are, certain configurations of rational curves, but the intersection matrix is an extended Dinkin diagram. So it's, um, so, so it's actually very closely related to the ADE singularities. Um, so, um, and the um, nodal cubic I've drawn here is the I1 type. So, um, so let me explain the next um, case of gravitational instantons, ALG. So here, the model metric on this, in this case, is just a flat metric on a T2 bundle over a cone of angle 2 pi beta, um, the complement of some ball. So we're just interested in the end here. Um, so the metric is just locally a product, product of flat metrics with the, the T2 metric corresponding to some parameter tau in the upper half plane. And then we just have the flat metric on the, on the cone of angle 2 pi beta. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just what the model metric is. Um, and it's just flat. And the metric cross-section of this is a certain flat 3 manifold, which is a, a T2 bundle over S1. So, and it, it turns out for all the known examples, only certain values of beta and tau are allowed. So the cone angle is restricted and the parameter in the upper half plane is restricted. And that's sort of because these known models can be compactified uh, to a complex surface by adding a finite monodromy singular fiber at infinity. Okay, so this is all the finite monodromy cases. There, there are ALG examples for each type of finite monodromy fiber. So these um, have volume growth is proportional to R squared. So these have quadratic volume growth. And the tangent cone in infinity is just that cone of angle 2 pi beta. It's just a two-dimensional cone. So the examples of these came from um, Hans Joachim Heinz's thesis. So what he showed is you can take any rational elliptic surface so that's the blow up of P2 in nine points. These arise from uh, pencils of cubics in P2, and then you resolve in an indeterminacy locus at the nine points by blowing up, and then you get a holomorphic projection to P1, and this is an elliptic surface. So now what you do is take one of those, take such a rational elliptic surface, which has one of those finite monodromy fiber, fibers, and look at the complement. So cut out that finite monodromy fiber from the rational elliptic surface, then the complement admits an ALG metric. And so um, any of these uh, finite, let me jump to the previous slide. So any of these finite monodromy fibers can occur as a fiber of a rational elliptic surface. So you get uh, families of ALG metrics for any type of finite monodromy fiber. Okay, so that's just roughly the, the ALG case. So one more, um, ALH. Um, the model metric in this case, this is perhaps the simplest 
to understand. It's just asymptotically cylindrical. I mean, the model metric is cylindrical with cross section of flat three torus. So the model metric is just G, G, dr squared plus uh, g on t3. So a metric, we just want it to be asymptotic to this. So that's known as asymptotically cylindrical. And the volume growth is linear for these. Um, the tangent cone of infinity is r plus unless it's trivially a product r times t3. So these are sort of maximally collapsed. So you get a one dimensional tangent cone. So, um, so again, the ex uh, examples of these were uh, arose in Heinz thesis. So now take a rational elliptic surface, but you just simply cut out a smooth fiber in this case, cut out a smooth T2. And then he showed there these um, always admit um, ALH gravitational instanton metrics. Okay, so th that was uh, four sort of classical, classical types. So it turns out that the, these previous examples, ALE, ALF, ALG, ALH, these all satisfy strictly better than quadratic curvature decay. So the curvature to ten ten tensor is big O of R to the minus two minus epsilon as R goes to infinity for some strictly positive epsilon. Okay, so, um, so uh, Chen Chen, this is Gao Chen and Xu Shang Chen have classified these. So any gravitational instanton with strictly better than quadratic curvature decay must be one of these types, ALE, ALF, ALG, or ALH. And furthermore, the hypercalar structure arises from the known constructions that I, that I out, outlined and mentioned the few names. So ALE, so, uh, oh, let me do this. So previously, Kronheimer had already classified the ALE case using twister theory. Um, I just wanted to mention Kamen and Hein have recently given a PDE proof using Tianyao Ansatz methods. Um, so then the, the ALF um, um, were constructed using twister theory by the names I had mentioned. So then the ALG and ALH arise from Hein's construction. So that's what this that's what this means. The known they arise from the known constructions. So they're they're classified in principle. I mean, they're not, ex it's not to say they're explicit. We don't know what the metrics are. They're um, gotten by solving Monge pair equation, but in, we know how, how they arise. Okay, so, so let me move on to my main thing I wanted to talk about is the, these two exceptional cases. So there are two classes of gravitational instantons which do not satisfy that strictly better than quadratic curvature decay condition of Chen Chen. So let me just give you a brief summary. So there's the type that's ALG star. So like the ALG, the volume growth is quadratic. However, the, the curvature decay is not strictly better than inverse quadratic. It's one over R squared log R. It's big O of that. So. Um, the other exceptional case is ALH star. So this is interesting. The volume growth of these examples uh, it have, is non-integral. So it's R to the four thirds. And the volume growth is big O of um, R to the minus two, but it's not any better at all. Okay, so let me, uh, my next uh, uh, few slides, I wanna tell you in detail about the ALH star. I'll give you the definition and classification. And then we'll go to the ALG star. So the ALH is actually slightly more sim simple to define than the ALG. So we'll do that one first. Okay, so let me just write down the model metric. I'm not gonna write down the, all the, the Kähler forms. So here, um, B is a positive integer. And so GB will be, uh, let me say what this is first. So this is, we take a, a three-dimensional manifold, which is known as a nil manifold of degree B. So this is a S1 bundle over a torus of, of degree B. Okay, so the metric looks like the following. It looks kind of like a doubly warped product. It's GR, dr squared plus r to the two thirds times the pullback of the flat metric on, a, on the torus plus r to the minus two thirds times um, connection form squared. So you take a certain connection form on this. And the connection form has, satisfies a certain curvature condition. So D of the 
the curvature of this connection is two pi b over the area of the torus times the volume element on the on the two torus. So we have a parameter here, which is in the upper half plane, which um, uh, measures which flat torus we have here. So for those of you who have seen, uh, so now this is just a, a Gibbons Hawking ansatz. So over, so Gibbons Hawking ansatz just takes input some flat three manifold um, and a positive harmonic function on that. So, so in this case, you take a, just the, the flat torus times R. So we use X, Y as coordinates on the torus and Z as the coordinates on R. And then the harmonic function is just two pi B over the area times Z, where Z is just the coordinate and, and R. And, and this Z is related to the distance R by this uh, relation. Z is proportional to R to the two thirds power, that's why. But if you make this change, you see that this is just a Gibbons Hawking ensemble metric over a torus times the times R. Okay. So let me just draw you a picture. So it's just asymptotic to this model. So in a compact set, there's no restriction at all. So as we go to infinity, it has this doubly warped product structure. Notice as R goes to infinity, the tori directions are growing but the circle directions are shrinking. So I've tried to illustrate that here. So the, the blue, that these uh, nil manifolds don't have a, a section, so there's not actually a torus living in here. So the blue represents the entire nil manifold cross section, which is getting large. So in terms of that uh, distance, so the diameter of these uh, metric cross sections is proportional to R to the one third, but the diameter of the circle directions is r to the minus one third. So it's this, this null manifold structure. Okay, so some remarks. So the volume growth, so from that formula I wrote down, you can easily see that the uh, volume growth is r to the four thirds power. Um, a computation shows that the curvature is inverse quadratic. And, um, and in fact, the the curvature is also in L2 of the end. I didn't, didn't write that down. Um, and the tangent cone and infinity is R plus. Well, so examples of these also arise from Heinz construction. So you take a, a rational elliptic surface, but now we cut out one of these infinite monodromy fibers. So it's a singular fiber of type IB. And really, this is just a, a, a chain of rational curves. That's what the, the this um, configuration of rational curves is, is like, this is the simplest case. Okay, so there um, were these known examples. So there's another construction which give these types of metrics. So it's a construction due to Tian and Yao. So for this, we'll, we'll let DP sub B be a degree B between one and nine del Petzot surface. So and let um, take a smooth anti-canonical divisor in this, which has to be uh, an elliptic curve. So what Tian and Yao showed is that the complement of this elliptic curve in the del Pezzo admits a complete Ricci flat Kähler metric, and this is asymptotic to what is called the Kalabi ansatz metric on a punctured disk bundle in the normal bundle. Okay, so what that is roughly, I've tried to explain that in one line here. So what they solve this by using Monchampere methods, solving a Monchampere equation on the complement of the divisor. And so they found that this Kalabi ansatz gives a good leading term, which is an approximately Ricci flat metric. So you take dd bar of i dd bar of minus log of the norm squared of a defining section of the anti-canonical divisor to the three halves power, just that's what it turns out to be. This is a um, nice approximately the Ricci flat metric. And they perturb by some dd bar of some function phi, where phi has some control and some de decaying weighted space. I'm not gonna write down the details, but there's a nice approximately Ricci flat metric, which they can use Yao's Montampere technique to, to find a, an exactly Ricci flat Kähler metric. Okay, so those are asymptotic to this Kalabi ansatz. So a theorem I proved 
jointly with uh, Hein, uh, Song's son, and Ro Bing Zhang, is that um, these Tianyang metrics on the complement of an anti-canonical divisor in a del peso is ALH star. And the metric is asymptotic to the, our model Gibbons Hawking metric plus some exponential decay term, e to the minus delta to the r to the two thirds power, and which is z, if you recall. Um, so to prove this, so it relies on just finding some improved asymptotics for the complex structure on, on the del pezzo as you asymptote to that anti-canonical divisor. And then, so we have to show, we showed that the leading term in the Kalagi ansatz is in fact asymptotic to that ALH star Gibbons Hawking model that I wrote down. So this is it's not obvious, the, this has the uh, error terms involving the complex structure in it. So it's not completely obvious that this Kalabi ansatz is, is the Gibbons Hawking. So that's something that was one of the main steps. And actually in a recent paper, we've determined the optimal decay. You can take delta to be um, square to lambda one, where that's the lowest non-zero eigenvalue of the Laplacian on that torus. Okay, so um, let me next tell you about the classification of these. So this is joint work with uh, Hein, Song, and Robin. Um, so with respect to the complex structure I, one of those hyperkähler complex structures, so any ALH star gravitational instant time must arise from this Tianyao construction um, slight, on a slightly generalized del pezzo, so called a weak del pezzo. Um, that means that um, anti-canonical bundle is big and neph. So um, on the complement of an anti-canonical divisor, so, but remember, I, I also said that these arise from Heinz construction. So, but, so, so that with respect to a hyperkähler rotated complex structure J, so that any ALH gravitational instanton can be compactified to a rational elliptic surface minus the singular fiber of type IB. So these are uh, sort of the same construction up using hyperkähler rotation that they compactify to different surfaces. So I want to say here, so we've classified it um, metrically using the Tianyao construction. We also expect in the latter case that the hyperkähler structure arises from a, from a slight generalization of Heinz ansatz, but we didn't uh, write that down because we already had the metric classification from the Tianyao perspective. Um, I should mention uh, Collins, Jacob, and Lynn have some related results in this direction. So one uh, corollary from this is that, um, so the degree of the del pezzo has to be in between one and nine. So um, remember when I defined ALH star, we, I took some integer B and Z. Well, that, that's necessarily restricted. So it, B has to be in between one and nine, okay, which is um, not obvious at all from the, from the definition. Okay, so let me uh, attempt to outline the, the proof of this. So to compactify that the um, sort of the asymptotically Calabi complex structure to a weak del pezzo, so what we need to do is, um, well, we are we have the the torus already, so we have a holomorphic coordinate on the elliptic curve, but we need a coordinate in the normal direction. So to find a coordinate on the compactification. It, start, it turns out that's equivalent to finding a nice holomorphic function on, the, on your gravitational instanton with certain prescribed asymptotics. And it has to grow at this rate. It's, it's a holomorphic function, which is like e to the k over two z squared. It's like a double, a quadratic exponentially growing holomorphic function. You need to, so the, the, the model space has this holomorphic function, but we need to prove that that extends to a global holomorphic function on our, on our uh, manifold X. Um, well, if you take uh, D bar of this, of the model function, but with respect to our, our, weak, our asymptotically Calabi complex structure, it turns out that this is big O of E to the K over two Z squared minus Delta times Z. 
So this is the same Z from before, Z is R to the two thirds power. So this is kind of problematic because what you'd like to do is standard Predhome methods. So if, if D bar of this was E to the K over two minus epsilon times Z squared, then you, uh, it would be easier to solve, but it's, it's, we see it's, it's, the, it's only slightly better. It still has the same leading term, but there's this minus delta to Z. But it turns out we can, we can still solve that for a function U such that D bar of U is this right-hand side using a Hormander's L2 theory with appropriate weights. Basically, this is the weight. Um, since this, the model space is one convex, so Hormander's techniques work to find this holomorphic function. So then you, this gives you a, a holomorphic coordinate in the normal direction to the divisor. So then using some algebraic geometry and the hyperkähler condition, we can prove there's a compactification to a weak del pezzo by adding the anti-canonical divisor D. Um, then we, we sh show that the, the hyperkähler structure has to come from the Tian Yao construction by proving a weighted DD bar lemma. So what it is, um, just roughly, so you're, you're given some um, um, gravitational instanton, you've compactified it, and then that, um, you, you need to re relate that to the, the cohomology class of that to the co compact the supported cohomology class on the del pezzo minus the divisor. And then, uh, but in that class, uh, you can show there's a, a the Tian Yao metric hyperkähler structure also exists in the same class. And then if you have a weighted DD bar lemma, so if you have two um, hyperkähler metrics in the same Kähler class, then their difference must be DD bar of something. And so that has to be harmonic with respect to a certain Kähler metric. And then um, uh, then a sort of Liouville theorem allows you to prove that, that, that that function would have to be constant. So then the, the two Kähler forms are, are the same. So this follows from a weighted DD bar lemma. Um, <clears throat> finally, to compactify the hyperkähler rotated complex structure to a rational elliptic surface. So now with this, you can use sort of the, the Fred Home theory. And uh, we also need a Leoville theorem that was proven in our previous paper. So here we show that um, e to the square root of lambda one times z plus i y is the function that can be extended to a global holomorphic function. And then this will be uh, close to the model one, and the fibers of this are, are elliptic curves. So then this, so you can use this as a coordinate to get to uh, compactify to a rational elliptic surface. So there's um, some details there, which I won't have time to go into. Um, but that's in a nutshell, the outline of the um, ALH star case. So next, let me, talk about the ALG star case. So, okay, so um, looks uh, kind of similar to the, to the ALH star case, but there's uh, one little extra step. So now, so we again take a nil manifold. So again, that's a degree B circle bundle over the two torus. And now we take um, D theta one, D theta two and alpha to be a left invariant coframe on the, on the nil manifold. So that alpha is a, gonna be a connection form for the circle bundle. And then the, the model metric looks like this. So, um, so B is now has to be an even integer two times nu. And now capital V is kappa naught. This is a constant plus B over two pi log R. And then the model metric is V times dr squared plus R squared d theta one squared plus d theta two squared plus V inverse times alpha squared. Okay, it just turns out um, that that is a, it's a hyperkähler metric. So I'll explain it on a, the next slide a little bit more. So, and here we choose alpha to be a connection form such that the curvature of this connection is B over two pi times the area form on, on this two torus where we have the theta one and theta two directions. Okay, so notice there's an R squared in front of the D theta one, but there's not any R squared in front of this D theta two. So um, 
if you know the Gibbons Hawking Ensemble, you probably spot what the base is already. But there's one little extra step we have to do in this case. So we choose an angular coordinate theta three on the S1 fiber. And now it turns out there's a Z2 action on this, which preserves the metric and all the hypercalar forms. So they descend to the quotient. So an action is this. So in the theta one, it's rotation by 180 degrees. In the theta two variable, it's a reflection. And in the fiber direction, it's also a, a reflection. So this is um, orientation preserving. And the cross section, so this was a nil manifold, but we took a Z2 quotient of a, a nil manifold. So the cross section will be an infernal manifold in this case. Okay, so I'm tempted to draw it, draw it here. So notice, so if you put R and theta one together, it's dr squared plus R squared d theta one, but we took a quotient by 180 degrees, um, by 180 degree rotation. So the, we, um, we have a projection to a base space, which is R2 mod Z2. And now the fiber here is a torus. So in the theta two direction, that's just an S1, but we have V here. So V had log in it, log of R. So V is growing. So these the theta two direction is getting very large, but then we have V inverse here. The fiber is getting very small. So we again see this sort of doubly warped product structure. And so as you go up to infinity, so these tori become very squashed. Okay, so that's just a picture. Um, so, so here's just symmetric again. So, uh, so before we take the Z2 quotient, this model metric is just the Gibbons Hawking ansatz over R2 times S1. So this was just an R2 here in radial coordinates, and this was just the S1. And the harmonic function that V was kappa naught plus nu over pi log R, that's just a harmonic function in R2. That's the Green's function. We can always add a constant to it. So that's what that was if you've seen the gibbons hawking construction. So the volume growth of these um, is quadratic. So like the ALG case, however, unlike the ALG case, the curvature only decays like one over R squared log R. So and that's not surprising because V had log in it. And the tangent cone at infinity, because we took that Z2 quotient is R2 mod plus minus one. So well, um, examples of these also arise from Heinz, Heinz thesis. So take a rational elliptic surface, but now you let D be a singular fiber of type I nu star. So that, um, yeah, that, that intersection matrix of I nu star is a, um, extended Dinkin diagram of dihedral type. So, but it turns out you could, this uh, rational elliptic surfaces only admit I, I new star fibers for new less than four. Okay, so, so now, um, so in recent joint work with Gao Chen, we classified this, this case. So actually any ALG gravitational instanton does in fact compactify to a rational elliptic surface by adding an I new star fiber. And the hypercalar structure does arise from Heinz construction. So these are Heinz thesis gave all possible examples. So it's really this, um, it was due to Miranda in person that they classified the possible singular fibers of rational elliptic surface. And the maximal I new star fiber is, has nu is equal to four. So if uh, in the definition of ALG star, I, we could have taken nu to be any integer, but it's only possible to have nu less than less than or equal to four, so which is uh, not obvious from the definition. Okay, so let me roughly outline this. So in this case, we we developed a Fredholm theory for the hodge laplacian on ALG spaces in, in joint work with Gao and Robing. So um, this didn't fall fall under the standard Fred home packages, so we had to had to work this out our, ourselves using basically separation of variables argument. So using this Fred home theory, then uh, we can prove there exists a holomorphic function on the total space to C, which is asymptotic to Z squared. So and that's 
uh, x plus i y squared as r goes to infinity. Z is just the standard complex coordinate on um, R2 here. And since we took the Z2 quotient, we have to take Z squared to get an invariant homomorphic function. So then, so once you have such a homomorphic function, then this gives an elliptic vibration. And this yields a compactification, which is an elliptic surface, um, by adding a fiber of type I nu star, and this does not have any multiplicity infinity. Uh, we can also show that there exists a section in infinity, a local section near 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 infinity. So using Kadir's work, we can get a compactification. So sort of using a Bachner argument, we can show the first Betty number vanishes. So then that implies that this compactification is a rational elliptic surface. And then similar to the previous case, we had to prove a, a weighted DD bar lemma. And, and uniqueness will follows from that. So that's just in a very quick nutshell how that is proved. Um, now let me make some re remarks. So so in very beautiful work um, last year, um, Song Song Sun and Robing Zhang have actually proved that any gravitational instanton must be of one of the above types, ALE, ALF, ALG, ALG star, ALH, or ALH star. So, so combining all the previous results, so this means that gravitational instantons are now classified. So, but I want to mention um, another result. So there's a, there were still a couple of remaining cases that which needed to be rolled out in Sun Zhang. So there's uh, another corollary and my work with Gal and Robing. So uh, you might you might wonder why in the ALG star definition we had to take that Z2 quotient. Without taking the Z2 quotient, that still defines an, a hyperkähler N. So but it turns out there just do not exist any gravitational complete gravitational instantons which are asymptotic to that ALG model space, ALG star model space, but without taking the Z2 quotient. And the proof of this is to use uh, our Fredholm theory to show that the function, so just x or y, so that's not that's not invariant under the z2 action. So um, this we could extend this to a globally defined harmonic function. Then um, d of that would be a harmonic one form, which would have to vanish by the Bachner formula and the maximum principle. But this just can't vanish because the leading term does not. So this gives a, a immediate contradiction. And there's another case that they needed to rule out, which was the ALG case, but with no group that they called it ALGE. So a similar argument can be used to uh, rule that out using Fredholm theory on ALG spaces. So, and so well, so it's, uh, that's the story of the classification. So, and the remaining time, I wanna just quickly go over the some relation to the K3 surface. So. That was all about non-compact gravitational instantons. So now I'm going to talk about the compact case. So it's known that the space of hyperkähler metrics on the K3 surface modular diffeomorphism is parameterized by this um, sort of symmetric space mod a discrete arithmetic subgroup. And the symmetric subspace is identity component of SO319 mod SO3 times SO19. And then um, so if I said modulo diffeomorphism here, if we had modded out by diffeomorphisms, which induce the identity on the second cohomology of K3, then we wouldn't need to take that discrete quotient. Okay, so it's analogous to type Mueller space. So this, this result follows from a global Torelli theorem for K3. So the hyperkähler structure is actually determined up to hyperkähler rotation by the, the span of the three Kähler forms and the second cohomology of K3, which is 22 dimensional, but the intersection form has signature 319. So what this is, this is a um, Grassmannian of positive definite subspaces in a, an indefinite signature um, Euclidean space. Okay, so, so we know what the, the moduli space is, but it doesn't tell you what the metrics are. So it's just, there's just a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so, um, so we really, I don't know any hope to get any simple closed formula for any of 
uh, Yao's Ricci flat metrics in the interior of the moduli space, but you can hope to describe what happens near the boundary, what degeneration can happen. So the general theory says we have a sequence of Ricci flat metrics, say let's normalize to unit diameter. So then there exists a gromov hausdorff limit. Um, Cheeger and Tian proved a beautiful epsilon regularity theorem, which said that the curvature can blow up at, at most at finitely many points. And so you get collapsing with bounded curvature away from finitely many points. So then um, at those points of curvature concentration, then you can take rescale limits, um, say rescale so that the curvature is one um, at some base point. And then if you get a non-collapse rescale limit, the, these are gravitational instantons. Okay, they have to be complete with the hyperkähler metric. And so while the, so Cheeker Tian sort of tells you away from the curvature concentration points, it's collapsing with bounded curvature. This is something that's been understood for over 40, 40 years. Near the curvature concentration points, well, we now know all possible non-collapsed gravitational instantons, but the, there, this does not tell you what happens in sort of the transition regions. How do you glue these, some collapsed piece and the in gravitational instanton bubbles. So the, so let me um, quickly go over uh, some of the known limits. So um, ALE and ALF bubbles can can occur by the following construction. So uh, ALE bubbles uh, occur in the setting of the just an example of the Coomer surface. So there's sequences of hyperkilometrics on K3 which have a four-dimensional limit, which is an orbifold. So this is the four torus modulo in a Z2 involution, and it just has a flat metric. And at the there are 16 singular points, and a Gucci Hansen metric bubbles off at those points. So in general, if you have any K3 surface containing some ADE configuration of minus two curves, you can blow that down and get an orbifold. And you can always find a sequence of uh, Ricci flat metrics with one of Kronheimer's metrics bubbling off at that orbifold singularity. <clears throat> so that's sort of the non-collapse case. So the uh, uh, very beautiful work, uh, Foscolo showed that ALF bubbles can occur from the K3 sequences of reaching out metrics on K3 by modifying the Coomer construction. So um, he, he allowed one of the circle directions in the torus to go to collapse, to go to zero. So then the, the gromov hausdorff limit will be three-dimensional, uh, three torus mod a Z2 involution with the flat metric. And then there's eight singular points and at each of those points, uh, ALF D2 metrics bubble off. So um, we go to the next case. So um, ALH and ALH star bubbles are known to occur. So the ALH case was done also by Chen Chen. So they showed there was a uh, sequences with a one dimensional gromov hausdorff limit, which is just a unit interval. And there are singular points at the endpoints, and at the endpoints are ALH bubbles. So in, in, in the interior, we have collapsing with uniform, uniformly bounded curvature, which is just uniform shrinking of a flat T3. So, and this is uh, produced by gluing together two ALH factors. Remember, these are asymptotically cylindrical, so you can picture just attaching two cylinders together with a long cylindrical region in between. And then using earlier ideas of Floor and Kovalev Singer together with a, a method for gluing hyperkähler triples. Um, so um, ALH star bubbles um, uh, we did in HSVZ. So we show there's also a one-dimensional limit. Uh, the singular points at the end at the end points are ALH star bubbles, have ALH star bubbles, uh, but there are also singular points in the interior. And there are Taubnut bubbles in the interior of the interval with nil manifold collapsing in the regular collapsing regions. And, and sort of this is, we produce these by gluing together two ALH star factors. But the, the problem is that ALH star metrics, if you recall that picture, they, they don't fit together. So we had to find a, a neck region which interpolates between two ALH star. And uh, that neck region was, uh, we, we found by using sort of an incomplete gibbons hawking neck region. So this was sort of a, a novel gluing because we took the two gluing 
factors, but we also had a, a neck with non-trivial topology. So there were three regions in the gluing. Um, okay, but let's see, I'm running out of time. So let me move a little bit faster. So um, ALG and ALG star bubbles, um, we showed occur in joint work with Gal and uh, Robin. So the ALG case happens. So while there's a very famous construction of Gross-Wilson, where there are sequences of Ricci flat metrics, which limit to S2 with the singular metric known as the McLean metric, and that collapses along an elliptic vibration. So the tori, tori collapse, um, but they only did the case of I1 fibers. So only um, um, nodal, nodal cubics. So, but, so we showed that, so if you have a K3 surface, which has um, some finite monodromy fiber that, um, what you can do is, so there's a, away from the singular fibers, there's a, an onslaught for a hyperkähler metric known as the green shapir Vafa yao semi-flat metric. And so, but that's singular near the singular fibers, but near a finite monodromy fiber, we show that the asymptotics of the dual isotrivial ALG metric agree with that semi-flat metric. So you can chop out the singular fiber and glue in an ALG instanton and show that and perturb to an actual Ricci flat metric on K3. So uh, let's see one more case, uh, ALG star. So um, this is also a joint work with Chen and Zhang. So given an elliptic K3 surface now with one of these IB star fibers, so we, we showed that you can resolve the singularity of the semi-flat metric by gluing in an ALG star bubble. And the, the key idea of this proof is somewhat similar to HSVZ. So we, we found a, another an incomplete Gibbons Hawking neck region, which interpolates between the semi-flat metric near the IB star fiber and then the ALG star bubble. So, um, so let me just quickly summarize. So the known gromov hausdorff limits and bubbles arising from sequences of hyperkilometrics on K3. So um, ALE bubbles occur in the non-collapsing case. So that was the Coomer case and the gromov hausdorff limit was T4 model and dilution. Um, ALF was shown by Foscolo and the gromov hausdorff limit is T3 mod Z2. So ALG and ALG star bubbles occur by what I just described and the gromov hausdorff limit is S2 with the McLean metric. Um, ALH star bubbles were, uh, and ALH star bubbles have sequences, so limiting to the, the interval. So the ALH case was Chen Shan and the ALH star was HSVZ. So basically um, every gravitational instanton which is allowed topologically can actually does occur as a bubble from a, a sequence of region flat metrics on K3 surface. So um, another part of Sun and Zhang's paper, um, they prove that these are all the possible collapsed gromov hausdorff limits uh, of K3, T3 mod Z2, S2, or the unit interval. So um, Odaka and Oshima have a, an interesting conjecture relating the uh, gromov hausdorff limits to the Satake compactification of the moduli space. So that was a symmetric space modulo, a discrete arithmetic subgroup. So there's a way to compactify that due to Satake. And so uh, it does seem that the, these boundary components do uh, correspond to the gromov hausdorff limits. They proved it in the, for the component corresponding to McLean metrics, but as far as I know, the, the other cases are not yet, not yet known. So, um, Pretty cool. uh, is there a question? Sorry, I heard somebody, I'm not sure. I think somebody um, just forgot to mute themselves. That's all. Oh, okay. So let's see, let's maybe have a, so let me mention uh, one more result. So this is regarding the uh, gravitational instantons. So, just because they're classified doesn't mean you, you, you know every single detail about them. So here's one, one thing. So that we, we, I'll mention a Torelli uniqueness theorem, which also, also proved with Gao and Robin. So if you have two ALG star gravitational instantons, uh, so notice there was this parameter Kappa naught in the definition. So you have two of these. 
So assume that the, the hypercalar triples are the same in, in cohomology. Okay, then they have to be the same. There's the diffeomorphism, which induces the identity map that pulls back the metric and the hypercalar triples. So this is up to scaling. So, so um, and the way we prove this is to use this gluing construction for K3. And then we use the Torelli theorem on K3. So we, um, so given two gravitational instantons with the same periods here, so you can glue the same thing onto it, onto each one to get K3 surface, and the limit as the gluing parameter goes to zero, then we can invoke the Torelli theorem on K3 surfaces and then get an isomet a hypercalar isometry here. So one open question is, we just proved uniqueness here. Um, we do not know the surjectivity of the period mapping in this case. So that's a good open question. Um, um, a similar argument yields a Torelli uniqueness result in the ALG case, but there's a slight complication here. So we need to assume the uh, sufficiently fast decay uh, order. So it has to be order two. So it turns out um, that in the ALG case, given an order two instanton, there's actually a moduli space of ALG gravitational instantons, which have the same periods. But the only that only a single one is of order two. The, the rest have not have a slower decay. And then, but so the if you assume the order two condition, then you do have the Torelli uniqueness results. So I uh, just wanted to mention this. And uh, another open question is surjectivity of the period mapping in the ALG case. So um, that's my last slide. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, questions? Hi, Jeff, this is Claude. Hi, Claude. Uh, so with respect to surjectivity of the period map, um, I think it, it might be helpful when, when you present this material to point out that, you know, if you if you actually are talking about hypercalar metrics on K3, you don't get surjectivity. You, you, I mean, there are constraints and it has to do with the fact that there are orbifold uh, limits, right? Oh, so yeah. that, you're including singular, singular metrics to get a, a, a reasonable statement. So one question I have is, do you think that there will be a similar uh, uh, kind of issue that will come up when you try to, to prove a surjectivity th theorem of, for the per period map in these uh, in these uh, collapse cases for these collapse limits. Uh, yes, you're exactly right. In general, there if, um, if you allow all cohomology classes, then you have to allow orbifolds. So what here? I just in in the this complete case. So all we need to assume is that these are not the zero. None of these are the zero class. So, so that's that the period domain. So all you, you just need to remove the zero class. And then we conjecture that you have surjectivity of smooth things. I see. Uh, the, the other comment that I was gonna to, to make just uh, for the, the benefit of the audience. Um, so it, it's, it's important to make people realize that there, there's still lots to do. And in terms of the original definition of, uh, of gravitational instantons by physicists, it was extremely vague what they were talking about. Uh, it's, it's simply been specialized by mathematicians to only be a discussion about hypercalar manifolds. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these questions about complete Ricci flat uh, four manifolds where we don't have a clue. And also that in, in, um, in the story that, a very beautiful story that you've told us, it's crucial that the, that the Curvature is assumed to be in L2. If you don't oh, yeah. assume L2 curvature, then God knows what happens. We simply yeah, there's we know no there are things out there that, that are very different. Yeah, there's a very famous paper of Anderson, Kronheimer, and yourself. So you, you can do a, a Gibbons Hawking with the R3 base and take an infinitely many monopole points going off to infinity. And then this, um, even this. Um, a Japanese mathematician, I forgot his name, he showed you can uh, vary the spacings between the, the points in that construction that you can get a non-unique examples with non-unique tangent cones. So yeah, that, that's a very good point. So the L2 finiteness assumption is crucial. That's really a topological finiteness assumption. Uh, 
basically. But if you throw it, give that away, I, if you throw that out, there's really no hopes for a classification. And yeah, your other point is very good. So I've, I've assumed uh, hyperkaler here. What if we just assume, uh, maybe just, just assume Kaler or even not assume Kaler? What is known? There's, there's really nothing known about just Ricci flat complete metrics that are not Kaler. So there's. So there, there are pa papers about uh, the case when it's not hyperkaler, but it's still Ricci flat Kaler. And of course, that will mean that you can pass to some finite cover. Some cover, yeah. There aren't so, so many. Not so many. Yeah. For example, in the ALE case, the the only ones that you get are AK are covered by AKs. And I had sort of hoped maybe there would be more to find there, but it, it, it's they're actually all given Haw Gibbons Hawking type. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Johan yeah. Schuweiner and um, uh, Evan Wright. And and, and uh, that's right, Evan Wright. Yeah. So, and yeah, the similar thing happens in these other cases. Some of these admit quotients. And actually, some of them admit quotients that aren't even Kaler. This was in, a, I, I think, the ALH case. Uh, Bicard and Minerve have a paper. So you can, there are, there's a Z2 quotient of an ALH, which is just, uh, which is Ricci flat Kaler, but not hyper -Kaler. And there's actually a, a Z4 quotient, which is not even Kaler. Mm -hmm. So, so they're sort of analogous to the Hitchin manifold, right? Which is a quotient of K3, which is still uh, locally hyperkaler, but it's not Kaler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I should end on that note. Thanks. I mean, there's still, even though they're classified, there's, that doesn't mean you can answer every question about them immediately. So there's still lots of interesting questions. Other questions? So, Jeff, I just had one kind of dumb question. Uh, I wanted to make sure I understood the statement. In the ALH star case, so you began, okay. the you began by explaining the model, and there's this uh, bundle of degree uh, B, I guess the parameter. Oh, yeah, let me, let me jump back to ALH. Sorry for the. Yeah, so, okay, so this is the construction of the model, right? And then, yes. then uh, later on, when you give the classification, you say you have this conclusion that B has to be less than or equal to nine, but you don't. Oh, see, yeah. So I don't understand. So in the construction, it, do you see? In a, the, yeah. I'm this to definition, that. B could be anything. B could be a million. And that we have a hyperkähler N. And so the, the, it just turns out there's no complete hyperkähler manifold with that asymptotics where B is a million. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's the, and the only way to prove it is to prove that these things have a compactification to some complex surface and then using classification of complex surfaces. That's the only way I know how to prove it. Okay, okay. It might be helpful, but, it might be helpful it, for, for this slide to uh, remind everybody that A is the area of the two torus. So uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, A is the area of the two torus, so. The okay. Because you want the d theta over two pi to be integral, so then that's, clear from this. Okay, well, so there, I might, I might mention there, there could be another way to prove this. Maybe um, if you could prove some, uh, maybe churn gauss binet and signature theorem, but with this type of asymptotics. So this doesn't follow under any of the standard uh, index theorems. This is a, a weird type of geometry, but if somebody if you can prove that, then there may be a hitch and thorpe for this type, and that that may imply that B is less than nine, yeah. less than or equal. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, let's uh, thank Jeff again.